spinning. <laughs> oh, and the spinning's over. We are live. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate your patience. Always fun seeing you guys hanging out in chat. Um, you guys are you guys are a big part of the show. Oh, so absolutely. let me actually do another rookie move. I learned last time that you can't hear this, but I can hear myself echoing in YouTube. All right. Back to the show. <laughs> And hey guys, again, thank you for joining us today. This is going to be a very, very awesome show. Um, I've got a guest, Green Goblin 510, with us today, getting it's ready to, to talk here. about a lot of really cool things. So, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, doing great. Good. Uh, waiting all day, you know, having a nice little chat with you. Nice, yeah, thank you. I'm loving the background, too. That looks like a magical, mystical fairyland over there. Oh, yeah. Digging that. Deep in the forest. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, just for, for everybody that's listening and everybody that's tuning in, um, you know, I, it's, it's really fun doing this show because I get to approach a lot of people that, you know, I'm learning from things that I'm seeing online and, you know, Green Goblin 510, you are definitely one of those people. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, dude, thank you. I was uh, on uh, with Photosyntech last Sunday and doing an interview, and one of his last questions is all, so who, who are you listening to? Who are you watching these days to learn from? And of course, my first answer is always the Future Cannabis Project, because hey, that's, oh, yeah. that's a great place to be. Um, but then I, you know, I kind of blanked it. And this is one of those situations where as soon as you know you hang up the phone or you separate from the person, you're like, oh, that's what I wanted to say. And <laughs> you, you, you were one of them. Cause I, you know, a lot of the people listening today have probably heard me say this before. I'm a very visual learner. Um, you know, I can, I could read the book, oh, yeah. have no problems reading. It's the comprehension that gets to me sometimes. But if somebody shows me something, I get, I pretty much get it the first time. And you, yeah. my friend, you, you've put out some really awesome videos in a kind of tutorial manner that suits me um, and I think suits a lot of other people out there. So thank you. Yeah, my, my yeah, pleasure. I try, to, I try to, you know, make it approachable for a lot of different people. You know, people like to learn, you know, auditorially or you know, visually. I try to do, you know, a little bit of both, you know, maybe put some graphics up on the screen, maybe solidify a point and, you know, Try to get a nice succinct video together for people. Yeah, well, that that definitely works. And how did how did you get started, or when when did your adventure into growing kind of get started? Well, that actually started quite a long time ago for me. Um, you know, I started uh, adventuring into cannabis. So I'll just say when I was uh, younger, you know, thirteen, fourteen years old, or whatnot, and <clears throat> I I soon realized that. Uh, I would definitely want to be using this plant for the rest of my life because it, it helped me uh, massively on a medicinal level. So soon after that, I, I realized I would, I would want to do that. Unfortunately, the laws weren't uh, in place at the time, but as soon as the laws came in place and here in Michigan, uh, I got my medical card uh, and started growing pretty much immediately then. Um, I also uh, grow for my mom and she, she uh, has an autoimmune disease. so. You know, we started, you know, back right when the uh, Michigan medical marijuana came into place. <clears throat> I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I did that again. Um, I was just going to say, and how did, how did that come about, you know, with your mother? Was cannabis something that she was aware of or knew had potential before this? Oh, yeah. Um, not to throw her business out there or anything, but she definitely was smoking long before, you know, uh, medical and rec was around here in Michigan and knew the benefits, uh, you know, that it could provide, you know, long before laws caught up. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, and I'm, and I'm glad they did in a lot of places and you know, that's great. Uh, education is key. And sometimes it's a lot of people, it's weird. Sometimes if you hear the same thing from a young person and you hear the same thing from an older person, a lot of times you're more apt to believe the older person. Um, yeah, because they got more experience, and, yeah. you know, that's, that's how it is in most cases. Life experience, so that's good. And then real quick, you know, I'm, I'm catching the, you know, the Michigan, um, and I see the 510 in, in the name. 
Did you ever live in California, Northern California? <laughs> Negative. I, um, the funny story on that was is that uh, when I originally made the name, I wasn't going to do, be doing any cannabis content creation or anything like that. I was, uh, I was big into vapes and doing, you know, making your own coils for, you know, the, the tobacco vapes and all that kind of stuff. And the 510 on the end is the, the size of the connection uh -huh. that most um, vaporizers use. I get it now. Totally cool. I uh, I used to live in the 510, which is kind of the Bay Area. I lived in 707, which was Santa Rosa. And mm -hmm. my, my brain just automatically goes to, you know, the zip code thing. Zip code. Not zip code. Area code. Area, area, area code. code. But uh, yeah, no, the 510 thread. That's, that's pretty cool. I've never uh, experimented in that world as far as the vapes. I know there's a lot of pretty cool customization. And I'm mm -hmm. sure we've all seen like the insane freaking cloud videos of smoke. Every time I see a car driving down the street and somebody, you know, takes this a big cloud. Hit, yeah, it just brings me back to the, the earlier days of life when that was like your life goal was to get the car smoky, open the door <laughs> and then like watch it waft out. <laughs> that was that was a fun Friday night. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So when, when you started gardening, have you did you do any uh, like traditional gardening beforehand or since like vegetables, uh, fruits and stuff like that? Oh yeah, I mean, we always have a little garden patch outside, and uh, for as long as I can remember, Mom was always planting flowers and you know de decorative plants in in the yard and whatnot. We always had some kind of little garden space, no matter where we were. Yeah, that's cool. Well, just just to clarify, are we brothers? <laughs> <laughs> we might be. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, so okay, so that's good. You had that. What kind of gardening when you started? Were you a, a Miracle Grow guy when you got started? No, uh, off rip, uh, I went down to the local hydro store and got, you know, yeah, it was a thousand watt uh, HPS many years ago. And then I got the Dynagrow line and I started with that. Um, I ended up doing, the, I don't know, maybe two or three grows with the Dynagrow line. Mm -hmm. And, um, I quickly got, um, I quickly got tired of having to th throw away soil and go get more soil. And I'm like, why am I putting all this? It, it seems like super inefficient. I, I don't like how this is going. So that's, that's when I started my path down uh, more organic uh, pathway I of growing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a real deal. I've got a little bin outside that I put, you know, spent soil in and I put more out there the other day and it's to the top. Uh, my garden beds are full to the top. My compost bin is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm reaching that point of uh, I need to build some new planters outside or figure out something better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I still use soil. I haven't gone the route of uh, a living soil or reusable soil yet. Just my interior uh, beds. Well, I don't have beds. My interior space doesn't, it isn't conducive to it. Um, <laughs> out, outdoors, I love, you know, trying to rework the soil or, or bring new life back into it. Uh, but that's one way around it. You know, a lot of people who live in apartments, uh, boy, uh, hydro systems, super beneficial. DWC is beneficial there. Have you ever played with uh, systems outside of a soil-based system, or has that primarily been your go-to? Um, it's been primarily my go-to. I have messed around with a little bit of deep water culture. Um, I did do a couple of buckets, just like single bucket grows of the deep water culture. And they turned out pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it, I, my ethos has always landed more towards uh, some kind of soil base. Yeah, and there's, you know, it's, again, there's, there's not one right way, but a lot of people do tend to have a preference of, of you know, whether, whatever method that they're using. And that, <clears throat> to me, like, I really love growing, but I'm also like a, kind of a little bit lazy and personally uh, I don't want to have to worry about a pump dying or worry about pH drift happening or worry about oh did the PPMs uh, go too low and now the plant's way too hungry or I, I don't want to have to worry about a lot of those different variables so 
that also aligns more with my ethos of I want to be able to reuse the stuff that I'm um, using at the end of the day as well. And so it just aligns up a lot more with how I like to grow. Yeah, very much so. That's that's kind of been one thing that has kept me away from the those automated systems. And again, it's all relative to the scale of what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the you know plant count that I have is completely manageable by one person. Uh, you know, if I were in one of those other states where you could have 99 plants, um, you know, I might be singing a different tune. I might not want to hand water all of that. But for now, uh, in my system that's how I enjoy doing it too, is, is, you know, getting in there. And it's, it's, you know, I almost want to say it's lazy because I don't have all of the other stuff set up, but, you know, moving parts can and will break at some point. And I don't want to come back into a room after they have. So if I, if I can manage it all, that's, that's how I'm doing it for now. Uh, I know a lot of people have, have tried around like with a blue mods or, or dripper system. Great system. Yeah, okay, I was going to ask if you've ever gone that route or tried the tried that. I do have a small uh, blue mat system. Um, it doesn't cover like the whole garden or anything, but it covers about four plants that I got going. And uh, I I really like the systems. They honestly they do not really can break down in them, which is really awesome. You, you're using gravity to feed your plant water, and then the in combination with capillary action, so. Yeah, it ends so, up once you have the system set, it ends up keeping you know, like pretty much the exact moisture content that you want, especially for a living soil, because in a lot of the living soils, you want to keep it a little bit more moist than what you would maybe let it dry out to using a mineral based system. And you want to kind of keep it moist there to kind of help or like protect some of the microbes. Is that correct, correct. there? Okay, so dry back, dry back is not a good thing. In, in a living soil type system then? No, it can actually stunt your growth, unfortunately. If you let the plant dry out a little bit too much, it will, it will slow down what's called the, the nutrient cycling that's happening inside that pot. And instead of uh, the microbes being able to nutrient cycle the whole pot, now they're just nutrient cycling this little, this little section in the center because that's where it stayed moist. Okay. And now the, now the plant's not getting nutrients to its outer roots because it can't, it can't be in coexistence with the, the microbiology and be assisted in that because it's a little too dry on the outside. That's why even uh, like a lot of new smart pots or fabric pots that are coming out specifically for living soil, they'll have kind of a plastic liner on the inside of it, just on the sides. And then right at the bottom, there'll be like one or two inches where they don't have that plastic liner. So it can still breathe and do its air pruning of the roots but it will also keep some of that moisture in so that the outside of the pot doesn't dry nearly as quickly and it will kind of dry out more uniformly. And that's smart too. I like that, that there's a little bit of, or the air is coming in at the bottom because that way it would dry from the bottom up or, you know, bottom down. It's not going from the outside two inches dry to a soaked core where you have, you know, your roots. This is yeah. dry. They have roots. You know, you need to hit that, but your core is still wet. Um, so I've never, you know, with the air pots and some of the fabric pots, that's been a, a potential drawback that I've seen with those. Um, you do also have the benefit though of the air pruning. So it's mm -hmm. kind of pick, pick your poison there. Um, wh one of my concerns, uh, you know, with like a blue mott system and, and, you know, I have definitely used these, um, in traditional gardening, love them. They're, they're good. Uh, one thing that I'm concerned of is the moisture just kind of staying in one area you had mentioned capillary action mm -hmm. so is that where the roots are kind of like taking you know taking the wet part and it's drawing it out into the soil to create even spread there absolutely um the roots along with uh, even the microbiology helps um, facilitate capillary action a lot of the fungi that we like to have in our soils to make sure that we have uh, you know good phosphorus and potassium uptake that will also transport water around very readily. So <clears throat> using a blue mat, depending on the, the size of the pot, you might need to use a couple of the blue mat carrots mm -hmm. just to make sure that it, it you know, one side and the, and the other side get a little bit of water so it doesn't take forever for that capillary action to happen. But at the end of the day, the, the capillary action will happen and it will um, become saturated to the point where that carrot will stop asking for water and it will, it will 
use a little check valve and turn off the dripper. Nice. And, and that's good because, again, uh, you know, you had mentioned that if little dry pockets get in there, the nu nutrient cycling isn't working as effectively. That can cause issues later with, you know, hot spots or lack of nutrients in mm -hmm. there. So that that's good to hear because that was always a concern is that all the roots were going to migrate to the carrot, kind of just hang out there and not really explore any of the other soil. But, you know, I'm that guy, I like to stick my finger down in there, uh, you know, five inches away from it. Yep. Is it still wet? Yep. Okay. Uh, but now but you'll definitely that see that they'll, uh, you'll definitely see that they'll congregate near the carrot because there is more water there, but um, they'll continue searching for more water throughout the pot as well. Cool. And, and how do the, the carrots get their feed? Is it um, like a gravity fed reservoir or do you need any pumps to kind of get it through the lines? I mean, you can do it both ways with the blue mat system. You can use pumps or um, okay. gravity. A lot of people go for the gravity, especially for like the home setups, um, where you might be doing just a tent and you're not doing, a, you know, rows of a farm. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people will go the gravity route. And even some of the people setting up big farms will go the gravity route, but you need a much larger reservoir at that point. Um, the, the big and, old water tower in the corner of the yeah. field. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, you can use pumps and, and pump it through, and uh, it will still use the capillary action of the, blue, the, the carrots, or even like a, they have a product called the drip tape. Um, it will still work just as well, except you'll have to actually time out how long it takes for it to become saturated. Right, and then so that you're not pumping the whole time. Now, do you have to adjust the amount of water it releases? Like I know, you know, it, three weeks into veg has a completely different root system than three weeks into flower. Um, I'm watering a whole lot more uh, that mm -hmm. third week of flower than third week of veg. Is that is there a way you can automate that or do you just kind of have to buy eye and then touch the dial? That, that's what's nice about the blue mats. Like as soon as you set it up in whatever pot and or bed that you're setting it up in, let's say it's going to be a seven gallon pot. As soon as you set it up for that, it's going to keep that pot at the moisture level that you set it at, no matter the growth of the plant. It will let more water in if the, if the plant's drawing up more water. Nice. Okay. Sounds pretty Because of the intuitive. capillary action. Yeah. It is pretty intuitive, but the, the only con is that you do have to get it set up correctly the first time. Yep. Yep. And, and like, yeah. I've seen, you know, I've seen a few people that the, the, you know, the, the stopper or whatnot didn't, uh, the float valve didn't go and they, and they did a little bit of flooding. Um, yeah. but you know, even the postal service loses letters every now and then, and they do a million a day. So shit mm -hmm. does happen. You can't always avoid it. Um, but so that's a good system. Do you, are you putting any sort of feed or nutrients into that water? Uh, no, most of the time it's just plain water. Um, hopefully the water that you're getting out wherever your water source is, is, you know, not crazily out of whack on the pH and doesn't have a, a crazy amount of excess calcium or magnesium in it. But otherwise it's just plain water. Are, are you doing anything to treat your water at home? I, I get mine out of the tap. It's about 60 ppm uh probably about seven maybe 7.2 ph so i nice. usually give it a little down and then do what that's I all need you really to. need yeah um i run uh, a whole house filter along with uh, another carbon filter right at where i get my water from so it gets filtered twice technically and then uh, yeah it comes out you know around 60 100 ppm maybe a little higher at maybe 7.3 7.4 and you know, again, this is something that I've just heard secondhand from many people, but when you're running that living organic soil system, you're not as concerned with the input pH as I am. You have the microbes in the soil to kind of buffer everything. And Correct. I mean, th there is a little bit of misconception when it comes to that. If you continually pour, you know, pH 8 water on your living soil, you're you will wear those microorganisms out basically okay um and th they will not be able to keep up with trying to adjust the ph for you on top of like there's a lot of amendments in the soil that like an oyster shell powder 
or any of the things that you're using for nitrogen or potassium and whatnot for those things to break down those things breaking down are an acidic process so if you don't have as much amendments anymore and you're running low on um, nutrients in your soil and you continually are pouring on ph 8 water uh, you're not going to have a good time the, the plants are going to show ph stress okay but if you have a a very thriving um, natural living soil that has a bunch of amendments in it you keep top dressing it you're using compost teas uh, using you know water that's you know maybe 7.4 maybe you know 6.3 or if it's in the, the general range of where plants like you know, the pH you're going to be completely fine even if you're a few points off okay so there is there is a limited uh, ceiling that you can push it there but you know that that makes total sense when you put it that way too because yeah i guess it's it's not infinite it has that battery but the battery can be depleted mm -hmm. when it comes to that so yeah i do need to pay a little attention and and the ppm of your tap is also probably pretty important but you've um, got it double filtered yeah you got it double filtered and it, having a little bit of calcium and magnesium and that which is a, mostly what's in uh, people's water sources for ppms um, doesn't hurt that much. Uh, a lot of people have to go get CalMag or make sure that they're adding oyster shell powder and other things in their soil to make sure that they're getting calcium and magnesium. Um, so having a, a few hundred or maybe a hundred ppm of a little bit of those things it doesn't hurt. So I know uh, there's a lot of alternatives for uh, to get calcium in the soil, um, you know, shells, uh, carbonate uh, to put in there. I'm not really familiar with magnesium. Is there kind of a standalone uh, alternative to the bottle for magnesium, or is it going to come attached with some other nutrients that you're using in the soil? Um, the, pretty, the standalone is uh, magnesium sulfate, you know, Epsom salt. Like, at, <clears throat> no matter what, we're when we're dealing with a living soil, whether you're going really hard hardcore with no till and you're trying to be very very clean um, when you make a soil that soil and the microbes in it are going to use the amendments you put in there to make organic and inorganic compounds some of these compounds are going to be uh, magnesium sulfate some of these are going to be you know some of these sulfates that are technically salts um, and you're going to need them in your soil these are natural salts these aren't concentrated in mind and then rebottled they're natural salts but you're going to need them <clears throat> so using a, a magnesium sulfate or epsom salt once in a while or during the making of your soil is going to help add that magnesium in there as well as there are some uh, bioaccumulators uh, plants that you can feed to your plants that okay. uh, uh, have high levels of magnesium. It's, it's just so, you know, for, for bioaccumulation, you're putting it in a soil that, you know, it has all the nutrients, it has the magnesium, but it's pulling up that magnesium, it's storing it within its tissues. Mm -hmm. You're chopping that down, putting it in, letting the, you know, the soil and the microbes eat that, you know, eat the decaying matter, and then that's unlocking that magnesium from the bioaccumulating plant. Correct. Okay, awesome. Awesome. And, uh, it, you know, it's funny you mentioned Epsom salt. Uh, I have Epsom salt. That's one thing that I'll use usually once in veg, once in flour to give it uh, a bit of that magnesium boost. I've, I've cut the cow mag specific uh, over the last couple of runs just to play around. Um, I'm seeing a few other sources that I'm getting it from. Uh, so I didn't really think it's, it was needed as a standalone. Um, but, uh, the Welch's grape juice I just put into flour, it was getting pretty darn yellow mm -hmm. and typically, well, not yellow, but light green. And a you lot can of see it was heading there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was all over the plant. You know, it wasn't just the lowers. It wasn't just the new stuff. It was kind of all over. And to me, when I see that majority of the time means your plant needs a little bit of sulfur. And that's mm -hmm. not something that I put in or have a ton of in, in the nutrients that I feed it. So using that Epsom salt is really my way to get those two micronutrients into the soil 
in an effective and meaningful manner. Uh, and again, I only do it a few times. Oh, so. absolutely. And, you, and that's the only thing you, you only need it a few times. And you could buy, you know, a couple pounds of Epsom salt at, at the store and that's going to last you a long time. Yeah, I bought the five pound bag. So yeah. I'm good. You know, I what I use uh, maybe two tablespoons uh, each each month or two months. Yeah. So. so, yeah. And it was a good price. And, you know, too, I looked for um, agricultural grade. I don't know if you do this with a lot of the ingredients that you're using, uh, mm -hmm. but there's always, you know, there's like the, you know, there's the, the store brand, there's the medical grade, there's the agricultural grade. Is that a distinction that you kind of look at in the ingredients that you're using? Uh, sometimes. Um, when it comes to like the Epsom salt, um, like agricultural grade is just going to be less cleaned up than the stuff that you buy in the store for like soaking your feet or for, you know, right. you know baths and whatnot. That, yeah. That's the difference is that they don't clean it as much, basically. They don't take all the, the byproduct, not necessarily byproduct, but different particulates and whatnot out of that salt, that Epsom salt. They're just like, hey, here's a bunch of Epsom salt and a little bit of extra dirt. <laughs> okay, so I should, I should maybe <laughs> move from an agricultural grade to a medical grade, but also on that same note, the stuff that you're buying in the store, sometimes it has dyes or it has perfumes, yeah. it has extra stuff. You definitely stuff want to make sure it's don't. just Epsom salt. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's why I went with the AG grade. Uh, farmers usually don't smell the best. So I figured they're not worried <laughs> about the perfume. <laughs> Me being a farmer, don't get offended folks. <laughs> <laughs> I smell too. No. Uh, so. You mess with some of that insect for us and you get that a little bit wet. I'll smell. Oh yeah. So what, what has probably been, I'm going to, I'm going to throw out there and chat, you know, I'd love to see uh, your input on this. Um, other than like fish guts, probably the stinkiest ingredient I've used is that super thrive. And that's not, you know, terribly popular, but man, if you crack a bottle of super thrive and put your nose over it, you know, Oh, what yeah. is what is what is one of the uh, smellier or stinkier ingredients or processes that you've encountered over your time? Um, I'd say it's a good tie between doing the Judam liquid sulfur and um, doing a Judam liquid fertilizer. Okay, so we were you know we were just talking about sulfur and how I was getting it from the Epsom salt. How are you doing the the Judam? method for sulfur what what does that entail and it's smelly so do it outside right mm -hmm. it, it's definitely smelly so do it outside or in a well ventilated area while you're doing it um but well you, when you're making the, the liquid sulfur for the jadam practice uh, that's mainly for uh, pest and disease resistance and maybe you already have a like maybe powdery mildew it's really effective against uh, powdery mildew and it'll create a somewhat of a little coating of sulfur on your plant and protect it for a few days afterwards. Um, when you're trying to get more sulfur in the soil, you just end up using elemental sulfur and just mix it in your soil. Now the same stuff that you're going to use to, uh, to make the liquid Jadam sulfur, you can instead of making it liquid, just use that powder and add it in your soil just as a garden amendment. So put, sprinkle it on the soil. Are you scratching it in like an inch or two mm -hmm. into the soil? And then the Scratch just it in. Oh, yeah. natural water, or the natural, mo natural moisture level from the soil is going to then kind of, you know, take it from the powder form into, into the next. Oh, yeah. And a bunch of microbes and, and, and all the microbiology is going to uh, mostly lives in the top one to two inches of the soil. And that's where a lot of the, the feeder roots like to hang out as well. So okay. it's all, all that amendments that you top dress and scratch in the top layer there, they're going to break down over the next week or so and go right to those feeder roots and make its way down the, to the rest of the pot. Okay. So, so that's kind of important. Something that I'm just my a gold nugget. I'm already pulling from you. Um, you know, again, we're talking about the microorganisms. They don't like the dry back, not very conducive to them. And, you know, if I just heard you, a lot of them, you know, they're all over the soil, but a lot of them live in that top inch or two. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, in, in my system, the way I do it, that totally gets dry before I'm thinking of watering again. But in a living soil system, that would be kind of a mistake. 
Yeah, and that's that's why a lot of people, you know, go, hey, do cover crops because that's a okay. living mulch, or uh, even doing the barley straw and you know mulching your your pots into our beds to make sure that you know that top layer doesn't dry out nearly as quickly. So everything dries out more of an even even keel. Yeah, and well, that that makes a lot of sense, and I'm glad you put it that way. You know, again, boom, bam, mind blown, <laughs> because look, man, I come from like traditional farming, big acre fields. I know about cover crops. I love cover crops. I use cover crops here when I don't have anything in my planter beds. But when I see people doing them in, you know, little five gallon buckets or, you know, just smaller, I kind of, it's, again, it's one of those things. It's like, I get the principle. I know what you're trying to do here, but it's, you know, sometimes just because you can do it, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, you know, I think that can invite pests. I think it can invite some other things, but the thing that I have been missing, and that is changing my perspective as we speak, is it helps retain that moisture level in those top few inches of soil. Mm -hmm. And I know that to be absolutely true. That's why, you know, we do it. We don't leave a field fallow for a variety of reasons. But yeah, you know, preventing uh, the evaporation and all of that is why we cover crops. So, wow, okay, in a bed that that makes a little bit more sense to me. Cheddar Bob, I see you in there. Mm -hmm. I won't make fun of your cover crops anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have and another good thing is that the, just by having those cover crops in there, um, those plants are feeding your microbiology. They're releasing exudates through their their roots into that top layer of the soil, helping the whole ecosystem continually thrive. Are you worried about them depleting particular, you know, nutrients like, uh, you know, clover? Is that is that, you know, that fixates the atmospheric nitrogen? Are you worried about that taking some things from below the soil from your plant? Or do you account for that when you're mixing your soil you know what cover crop you're going to use so maybe you add a little bit more or is it even just doesn't matter it's not uh insignificant pull it's a it's very mostly insignificant insignificant um unless you end up planting something that flowers out or fruits out if you're planting you know a daikon rye or you're you're planting something that creates a fruit or a vegetable or a seed of some kind it will take more but if it's more just like a, you know, a clover or a something like that, it's not going to take a whole lot. And a lot of people like to take the opportunity to chop the clover down and just let it sit right there and break right back down in there. So it's just continually cycling the same nutrients. So you're not really taking too much out. Yeah. So you're, you know, again, the, the plant will pull it up, but you're putting it back into the soil so it doesn't go too far, just maybe changes forms. Yeah. Do you have a preferred cover crop or do you change them or rotate them based on the age of the soil you're working with? Um, honestly, just a blend. You get, they got those, you know, 11, 12, 13 seed blend cover crops so that you can, many places have them. Just get a, a nice, healthy diversity um, of a cover crop and you know, maybe reseed every once in a while if, if you see some are dying off or or something but other than that that's all you really need to do that makes sense that makes sense back to um the sulfur too we're talking about the liquid sulfur for jajam for jadam um i'm assuming you're applying that as a foliar spray because you said it kind of will leave the sulfur coating right. on the plants uh usually you know with regular sprays people are saying don't do it with lights on how about in your instance? Is it a lights on, lights off type thing? Well, it's always a great idea to spray what, whatever you're spraying with lights off, or at least dimmed uh, substantially. But what also helps a lot is if you're making sure that you're using a wetting agent in every single one of your foliars. Like a Whether it be silicon? for pest management or for uh, just feeding, like you're just trying to feed your plants some little microbes. You, like a uh, silicate, like aloe, uh, yucca extract, uh, saponin extracts, quilla extract, some some kind of wetting agent or a jadam wetting agent you can make for really cheap and have a, a bunch of it for quite some time. But I, pretty much every time you want to spray anything, I would recommend adding a wetting agent. 
because that's what what's, that's going to do is break the surface tension of the water and it will be a lot less likely to cause a little bubble to form on top of your leaf and that's what um, that's what burns your leaf by causing a magnifying glass and then the light goes through it and it burns your leaf so if you break that surface tension you you can spray with lights on mm -hmm. but i would still advise extreme caution and then turn them down right so so yeah when when you when you have the option which most of us do um if you have to get a spray on like right now you've waited too long <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah you should, should be able to wait and do that with lights off and you read my mind about you know the, the wedding agent what does it do um yeah if it's preventing those beads that's huge does the sulfur though sitting on the outside of the leaf does that clog the stomata or does that cause any problems with like transpiration from the plant now uh, just like with anything overusing something can can be harmful so if you use the sulfur spray and you got a, an especially bad problem and you have to use it several weeks in a row that may actually start um, harming the plant by it not being able to transpire as much it not be able to you know do its normal functions but no matter what kind of spray you're using, another recommendation of mine at least is every time you spray, the next spray that you do should be some kind of washing. Okay. What, okay. Whether it just be clean, clean water with maybe a little bit of a wetting agent or just clean water, plain water, rinse it off, and then on the next one, use a treatment again. Okay. And is this anything that you would spray in flour? or do you primarily keep it to, to veg? I mean, at pretty much at all times, you wanna to try to keep it to veg. Uh, you can go up to maybe, you know, maybe one to two weeks into flower, um, but spraying anything in flower is gonna harm the pistils and uh, may cause a newer grower to think uh, other things are going wrong because now the pistils are turning color and it's two weeks in. You're yeah. like, oh, what's going on? R really good point too because a lot of times if i see pistols changing in that second or third week i'm like where's the herm <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be one in here uh, yeah so yeah unfortunately spraying almost anything whether it be the jam or uh, sulfur water um, while there's pistols present can turn those pistols uh, you know a brownish color you know making yeah. the diagnosis even more confusing yeah, yeah, that's um, new growers and old growers alike can get into a lot of trouble uh, just by looking at the surface of things. We'll, we'll see one thing then react, but uh, it's the big picture that we're actually missing. So everybody does that at some point, some, some people continuously. Mm -hmm. And, and I know sulfur, um, I've heard sulfur sprays as well. Uh, I have heard that they're very smelly, but also, you mentioned a little bit of IPM. Um, you, it helps on the powdery mildew. Uh, mm -hmm. with, with powdery mildew, that's something that's probably going to be coming up, you know, this time of year, uh, especially in the area where I live. I, I can't grow outdoors because it will get PM uh, <laughs> no matter how hard I try. Um, if you're seeing a little bit of PM on leaf, and this is something that, you know, there's there's multiple answers out there, but are you kind of trying to strip leaves and, and then take it off and then, you know, spraying what you consider good or are you just spraying everything and then that's kind of going to take care of the problem and those leaves will go back to, you know, good photosynthesis and health? Uh, my personal way of going about it is um, whether you're using the sulfur, if it's early on in veg, or maybe you're using, a, you know, a milk water combination, that's a popular one out there as, as well. Um, I would spray it first and then I would remove the leaves that are uh, extremely covered in the powdery mildew because spraying that first is going to make sure that the spores that are on that, that leaf are become more inactive and they're not going to spread nearly as far while you're removing that leaf. So That's I it. like to spray before I remove a bunch of material and then I, I will remove a bunch of sickly material and maybe spray again the next day. Um, and then the, the following day after that, I might spray with just water and then not spray anything and see, um, you know, see how she recovers. 
excellent very excellent point something to probably you know that's easy to overlook is those spores flying around so yeah great point spray it first uh, kind of almost think of it as like pollen you don't want the pollen flying around we've all had that so what do we do after you know we pollinate we we spray things down and get that water bottle yep yep help neutralize it so that's that's a great great uh experience tip right there do that um, I imagine you probably turn off the fans. Are, same thing when, when you're spraying. You're turning off all of the fans in the room and just letting it be still for a little bit afterwards, or when do you turn them back on? Oh, yeah. Um, I definitely turn off the fans, and, you know, whenever you spray them down, you're looking to get them, you know, especially when you're trying to go after a, a PM issue or maybe a bug issue, you're trying to make sure that entire plant is covered in whatever solution that you're using. So the fan needs to be off, and I like to leave it off for 20, 30, 40 minutes after the fact and let it dry naturally. Nice. Nice. And, and how, are you, how are you spraying it? Uh, are you just using a regular squirt bottle? Do you have a fancy electrostatic backpack like a Ghostbusters? Or? Oh, I wish. No, I just have a standard, you know, $10, $15 hardware store, you know, pumper. Perfect. Pump sprayer. Okay. And that works. Yeah, I bought I bought one of those as well, uh, like the little two gallon, two yep. gallon hand pump deal for uh, all those corner, all the corner plants that you just can't reach when <laughs> something gets a little bushy. You got that wand there yep. to make life easier. Do you have to clean like do you have to bleach it afterwards or just rinse it out with water and you're good? I just rinse it out with water. Um, I will say. Um, I like to keep a few of those different 10 or $15 pump sprayers around mm. because I'll keep one for just, you know, water and maybe aloe, you know, light foliar sprays. And I'll keep one that just for, you know, like sulfur and other IPM um, sprays. And I'll keep another just for maybe an, an enzyme spray that I like to use once in a while. That's mm. a, called Tweetment Enzyme Cleaner. And that is that being an enzyme um, and not necessarily knowing it, it sounds like something that would get on an insect and kind of like corrode or eat its body. Uh, Correct. It is, is a, it is a, um, it's not actually advertised for this, but um, it works exactly, you know, they've done tests, the company themselves have done tests for it. It was manufactured for home cleaning industry, huh. but okay. um, it also you know, helps, you know, with like, bed bugs and you know other bugs that we would want to get you know fleas and ticks and whatnot out of carpets and and stuff like that um but it is an enzyme that breaks down the uh, exoskeletons of bugs basically okay uh any benefit against fungus gnats because <laughs> i know sometimes uh, people get those or is it something that you would actually this enzyme would you actually put it on the soil surface do you want to keep it away from the soil now you probably want to keep it away from the soil. This is mostly, a, you know, a foliar topical um, spray. Okay. It is amazing what they use too. Uh, you know, I, I chuckle and worry every time I pick up my dog's flea medicine because the main ingredient is spinosad. Uh, I was first introduced that as an organic method for killing thrips and aphids in the mm. veggie garden. So I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Uh, and I don't know if this story is true. This is what the vet told me and I wanted to believe it. So I believed it, but evidently there was, you know, like fleas and stuff in the area where they manufactured this stuff. They had a little bit of, you know, dumped stuff outside. All of a sudden they noticed, Hey, there's no more fleas. Wait a minute. This works on fleas too. <laughs> Put it in a dog medicine. So I guess that's how And that's the thing is, uh, the spinosad is a bacterium. So it's, uh, it's like a bacteria, but it's slightly different. So huh. it is what, uh, what the government likes to call grass or generally recognized as safe. Okay. Um, I like that. I, did you see the wheels turning there? I'm like, Gee. Okay. Generally. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, again, that's uh, that's for the small dog. So I, I got to make sure it's safe, but yeah, it's so far so good. Knocking on wood. Uh, fleas are evil this year, but no, yeah. that's, I've, I've never met a cannabis plant with fleas. So we'll, nope. I'll, I'll move on from that one. <laughs> you do, you do a lot of other 
preparations. And again, um, you know, everybody, please, I'm going to put your name back up here for those who don't know. Green Goblin 510. Um, a lot of great videos on making these ingredients on your YouTube channel. And again, Thank that's a, that's a place that I've learned from and will continue to learn from. So please keep making them. <laughs> Do you, what, what are uh, some of the, well, I guess not favorite, but some of the most common mixes that you're doing there or, or what are, what are the uses there? I'm again, oh, I'll let you answer that one. I'll go to the next one. I have so many questions. <laughs> Well, uh, when it comes to different like Jadam or KNF natural inputs, th that's the really great thing about growing organic or in a living soil system is that you can kind of pick and choose um, different things that you like from all of the different systems. Because at the end of the day, there's there's a Jadam natural farming, there's a KNF natural farming, there's a natural farming out of India, there's a natural farming out of Hawaii. And they all have their little different caveats and nuances. But if you, you know, study them all or, you know, you like this one thing from the, the Hawaiian natural farming, and you like this one thing from a Korean natural farming, you can mix and match these as, as long as you understand the full system of we're just trying to feed and build the soil. Again, you're, you're, you're pretty much reading my mind here. That was the second part of the question <laughs> uh, I was going to, because, you know, again, there, there's a lot of methods out there. Um, you know, the Jadam, the KNF, uh, Hugel culture, a lot of the, the ones that you had mentioned too, and not to, not to start like a religious debate, uh, but I know a lot of religions are fairly similar, but there's little differences that make them what they are. Is and that kind of almost seems like the case with a lot of these gardening techniques. It's all they're all uh, on a similar path. Um, they they have a lot of the same ideas, but there's there's differences, and and I'm ignorant to to what those differences would be. Are there some? Mostly, they're just uh, geological differences. Honestly, okay. you're only going to get certain plants in Korea. Okay. So that you're going to be able to make different natural fertilizers from those plants in Korea. And you're only going to get certain plants in, from Hawaii because that, that's their native environment. So a lot of it's a geologically based differences. Otherwise than that, it's all, it's all the same science. Right. Just using different materials that are local to your area. That's awesome. That, uh, that makes absolute sense once again to me. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, again... This is sometimes when I'm talking with people too about certain practices or certain methods there, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm more of an indoor person. So, you know, it'll be one specific environment in, you know, let's just say Colorado. Um, what, what you're going to do there for drying is going to be completely different than what I'm going to mm -hmm. do here, but that's just based on the environment. So, so I guess similar to, to what you're saying is the, you know, the, the landscape kind of dictates what you're doing there. So that's, that's an interesting way for at least someone like me to look at it. That makes a lot more sense. That reduces it from the, well, this practice is the best. Well, this practice is the best. It's not necessarily that argument. It's doing what works in the environment. What, what's for best you. and yeah, what's best for you, what works for your situation, for your land, your land may need something else completely different and you're like well i really like this you know method of making this input well you may not even need that input you might need an entirely separate input because you are already bacterial dominant in your soil you need a bunch of fungally dominated stuff to try to get your fungal numbers up you know so yeah there's no one that's better than the other it's exactly what you said it's whatever works for your situation for your land for your environment See here, all chat on in the Netherlands is made from tulips and cheese. Facts. Uh, <laughs> that would be interesting if they had a cheese tea. I'm sure there's some interesting microbes in there. Uh, I'll drink it first. I'll drink the Kool Aid. So that's that's a good one up there, Blaze. Oh, I love I mean, chat. It makes complete sense. They got they got the big uh, tulip festivals and whatnot. And what are you gonna do with the tulips when you're done with them? Yes. Might as well turn them into fertilizer for more tulips, right? Turn turn them into fragrances. I uh, it's funny. I, I lived as a kid. I lived in Holland, but not the Netherlands. 
Michigan. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that's like my, I do remember tulip time and the, the tulip day parades and all of that stuff. But uh, yeah, tulips, eh, they're, they're good for something. They're pretty too. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Oops, sorry, flipping, flipping screens there. I'm, I'm kind of uh, no, not a problem. Do, doing, uh, doing the producing back end work here today as well. So trying to trying to do a couple of things at once, but appreciate. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> have you ever experimented growing outdoors with cannabis? Um, a few times, but uh, when I did, um, I will just say they were they walked away. Okay, yeah, that, that's another concern of, of outdoor gardening. Uh, but I know a lot of people are uh, sitting on the porch these days with the lights on right now. It's coming up to Croptober, so uh, <laughs> be beware of uh, yeah. the helicopters and the rippers. But we don't have to worry no, about that. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 When you're indoors and in a, in a legal state, you don't have to worry as much about it. But yeah, keep a lookout still. Definitely. So I know there were a couple... Um, other videos up on there. Uh, the WCA is something that I first saw. Um, Chris Trump. I watched a video on that. Mm -hmm. Just kind of show how to shout make that. To Chris. What's that? I said shout out to Chris. I'm oh, yeah. a, a lot of the stuff. I, I'll be honest. A lot of the stuff I learned from him as well. I learned from you know uh, Matt Powers is another great um, yes. YouTuber and uh, yeah. author. Yep. He has a really great book. Uh, you know, teaming with microbes. I, I learn from a lot of the, the same people that, uh, you know, everybody else learned from. And that, that's what's so great about, uh, you know, the organic system is that we're all just trying to share the information and get everybody to be able to grow healthy, whether it be food or medicine. I like that. And I did, you know, I saw Chris doing a lot more of uh, traditional farming as well. And that's, you know, that's, that's a really big test to me too. Um, a lot of times that is where people are trying to go at scale and, and derive an income from uh, in mm -hmm. a method. So you you can't really mess around when, when you're working at that scale or you are counting on orders oh, yeah. to be filled, what? CSA boxes to go out. He has a huge, uh, what was it, macadamia nut farm? <sighs> uh, he did a few trials of, of, the, of the whole can of to try to you know show people, hey, you can scale this up pretty big. Yep. And let's see here. I got a question coming in. I screen goblin about a CO2 converters. Ah, um, do you have CO2 converters or what I think is I know that? it. I think I know what she's talking about. I, uh, I made my own CO2 sensors instead of, uh, oh, wow. making, uh, you know, going out and buying a, a few different CO2 sensors. No, um, why, why did you decide to make one? Is it just cause you were curious or did you think there was something better that wasn't out there? Uh, no, it was uh, mainly because I wanted it to work the way I wanted it to work, and a lot of these CO2 detectors and, and meters and whatnot, they'll they'll take uh, you know readings and they'll have history, and you can go through the history and whatnot. But a lot of them don't report back to a computer or report back to a server, so that that information can be saved. Okay, well, let's see here. She says controllers. <laughs> I'm picturing my little Nintendo joypad right now. <laughs> Jump. And uh, it happened to be around $45, 50 cheaper as well to make the sensors. So that didn't hurt. Okay, that's cool. Were you surprised by any of the findings? Do with your cover crops, are you finding that you have a higher ambient CO2 level? Um, not much with the cover crops, but what I did notice about a huge boom in CO2 is whenever you're using either a compost tea or a uh, Jadam microbial solution. If you just apply a compost to your Jadam microbial solution, you will notice a large uptick in your CO2. And is that the microbes demanding the that microbes. extra CO2? The, okay. These microbes, a lot of the microbes in like a Jadam or a, a compost tea, they are um, Aero you know, not anaerobic, they're aerobic. They like to breathe oxygen and exhale CO2. Okay. So when you breed a huge population of them and then add them to your soil and then they're like, hey, there's a bunch of food here, they're going to eat and breathe and you're going to have a bunch more CO2 for 
from what I've seen, and at least in my space, for almost about five or six hours after the fact. Wow. That's that can be pretty, pretty effective. And how often are you applying uh, something like this tea? I, I, I usually do maybe a couple during veg and veg might last maybe 30 days, maybe 40 days. Okay. And I might do, you know, one, maybe two during flowering. Okay. So, so not all the time, but again, still it has that little added benefit there. Um, I've never been in like a sealed enough environment to supplement with the co2 have you ever played around with co2 supplement whether it be canisters or like even the little mushroom bags um i personally haven't played with co2 enrichment um mainly because i i don't have a sealed space neither i'm drawn in fresh air and accent you know expelling hot air out of the house yeah. so I'm, I'm not sealed up either i got the co2 sensors just to make sure that i wasn't going too low in CO2 mm. because I have a, a bunch of plants and a relatively small space and they can use up all the CO2. Matter of fact, uh, that did happen in a couple, I'd say a couple weeks ago, my CO2 got down to well below ambient around 200 PPM wow. and the, the plants did not like that. No, what what sort of signs from the plants are you seeing? Do all the leaves just kind of wilt down? Do they lose their praying status, even though it's yeah, watered? They, they lose their praying status. They look uh, wilted. They look hungry, okay. even though they have plenty of food. They couldn't use any of the, the CO2 to, to make energy to eat that food. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. My, my gears are turning again, going back to that plant that, you know, had a little bit of light greenness all over it. I added the sulfur and that really helped. Uh, but it's also a very trained plant. It's very big for the space that it's in. So it's, it's you know, maximize your net, fill every mm -hmm. hole. I've filled every hole. Um, and I haven't had one quite that size in there. Um, I don't monitor my CO2, but that's something that I've been curious about. And, you know, that might be another piece of the puzzle because, again, that's that's why I asked, do they start wilting instead of praying? Just based off of the things that I've seen. So that would be... Yeah, they'll, uh, they'll stop drinking as much. You'll notice mm -hmm. that as well and be like, wow. That, I mean, that happens towards the end of a plant's life as well. But you could be a couple of weeks in the flower where you know, hey, th these these girls are going to be drinking more. They should be wanting to drink more and more. Right. Uh, and I haven't had to water in four days. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then that leads to a whole host of other problems, at least, you know, in my system, the, the, you know, the pH of the soil will start turning with the water sitting in there. That'll mm -hmm. cause, cause nutrient uptake issues. And it's just a chain event from there. So that's, that might be, you know, something that is getting overlooked by some people, potentially, you know, we all want to maximize our space and fill it out. Um, but if we're not monitoring CO2 actively, that, that could bite us. That's interesting. I like that. But granted, a lot of people growing at home, you're going to be completely fine, especially you have an intake and an outtake fan on your, your tent. Um, there, Indoors, there you have a naturally higher CO2 just from people being indoors, and you know gas burners, you know hot water heaters and things like that. You know, Gray the sunroom brings up a really good point. He uh, drink he drinks up all the uh, CO2 from his gas stove and other things and puts it in his room. And when he cooks, he gets about three thousand ppm. Okay. Now that is a little high on on the CO2, and you can start getting that CO2 toxicity. Mm -hmm. That's actually a thing. Um, but as long as it's not at 3000 for too long, you should be all right. You, keeping it at that 12, 1500, that's where you want to keep it. Um, 3000 is actually quite dangerous for humans to be in as well. So don't spend too long in a space <laughs> yeah. that, uh, has, you know, 3000 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Cause you may get uh, a little drowsy and fall asleep in there. And that's the last thing you want to do. Yeah. That might be the last thing you do. And uh, mm. let's just to, to throw it back to, to the beginning of the, the episode, um, I want to shout out Photosyntec again. Uh, he, he did a video this week. It's just a three minute video. Uh, it's probably one of the most important things in your grow room and nobody talks about it. Face palms when, when I heard it and I saw it. Fire detectors, folks. Mm -hmm. 
make sure you have smoke alarms in your grow room. Uh, make sure I have them in each chamber. Uh, make sure you have a fire extinguisher on the way to your grow room or next to your grow room. If something, you know, hits the fan, a light falls, a fan shorts out. I think that was the example he gave. Um, yep. Those things are so important, guys. They're so overlooked. Uh, 20 bucks could save your life. And mm -hmm. to your point of, you know, too much CO2, I have a CO2 sensor in here as well. And that's what brought me up on this rant is, you know, <laughs> I have my CO2 sensors. I have it placed low because the CO2 is heavier awesome. than the air. It's going to fall down. Um, sorry, little bug <laughs> flying around. Um, so yeah, you, you know, make sure to have that in your garden, in your grow rooms, especially uh, when you are supplementing your CO2. You don't want that to get into dangerous levels. 20 bucks, easy solution to know that you're going to uh, <clears throat> not fall asleep and not wake <laughs> up. So. Yeah, a lot of people might be growing in their, their own room, you know, they got a tent right next to them. And if you're supplementing with CO2, definitely be careful if you're doing that in the same room that you're sleeping in. Yep. Let's see here. Uh, <laughs> just reading some of the comments. Oh, the fire department knows where the cannabis growers are at all times. <laughs> oh, they might. They might. But uh, come on down, guys. I got some fire for mm -hmm. you. No, just joking. And Green Lantern's right. Yeah, water is no good for electrical fires. That doesn't, it doesn't help put them out. Yeah, let me put that up there. So electrical fires, again, uh, it's like a grease fire. Don't put water on it. Uh, if you don't have a fire extinguisher, I think, what is it? Baking soda, baking powder, or am I just baking making helps. it? Okay, good. Make sure I'm not turning it into a flash, <laughs> flash bomb. <laughs> just throw sugar on it. No. no yeah. The, that powdered creamer you can make a, um, hell of a explosion with. They use it for the, uh, pyrotechnics industry and make effects and whatnot. Wow. Wow. Well, I guess when in doubt, just use CalMag. I heard CalMag solves everything. If duct tape can't fix it, CalMag will. CalMag, yeah. CalMag. Uh, so, okay, cool. We, we've got that. We've got the CO2 kind of covered there. Um, are there any, you know, before we go into the garden, are there any kind of supplementals that you're adding to the garden? Uh, I mean, on a regular... Not really. I'm, I'm just using the, you know, the, the standard amendments a lot of people use, you know, alfalfa meal, knee meal, kelp meal. Cool. You know, yeah, that was kind of a bad question. Yeah. That was kind of a bad question. Sorry. I'm, sometimes, a, a lot of people, I guess, something I do that a lot of people either haven't heard of yet or um, haven't experimented with it yet, uh, Class McCoot, which is a, a huge uh, influencer in the organic sphere before uh, you know the whole YouTube thing came around big on the forums big you know everywhere uh, he makes and shows people how to make a really good kelp meal tea in which you can use for a, a foliar spray which the plants really love so I will do that from time to time do you ever so, well you're probably not near a body of water I'm right next to the ocean I have that stuff sitting on the beach every day but I have yet to collect any of it and use it and brew it down <laughs> um, is that is that something that you would collect in the wild or do you prefer to kind of source that from a clean clean supplier it, it really depends on uh, you know on your area if you if your area has a decently clean waterway um, and you feel pretty confident in taking what you're uh, you're getting and right. drying it out you can definitely go for it i, I don't live too close to a, where i can get some actual kelp i well i got fresh water surrounded by fresh water so yeah. i can't go to the ocean and, and get that um, but if you aren't close to the ocean getting a, a clean product from like a build of soil or a west coast uh, horticulture has some really great clean products as well as a good standby. Yeah. You mentioned earlier too, using some, um, you know, plants that have bioaccumulated particular nutrients that you're after and then putting that back into the soil, letting it break down, kind of returning the basically nutrient cycling. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you're gathering from the wild, like um, a nettles or uh, any other plants that you use in your preparations that you bring into the garden? Um. 
Yeah, nettles is a really great example. They have, they're high in potassium and in silica. Um, they're also uh, bracken ferns is a really great one as well that um, a lot of people have access to. It's an extremely prevalent plant, but that one's really good for making a jadam herbal solution, which is a, um, really good for you know, helping keep pests away from your plants. Um, then even, you know, standard grass or um, clippings and whatnot, you can turn that into a Jadam liquid fertilizer and hmm. use that as well. The main thing when you're looking for a lot of these plants is that you're looking for plants that A, are healthy, especially if you're trying to use them for a, a fertilizer, or B, um, you can see withstand pest pressure. You can see plants to the left of it totally covered in pests, and this plant is just out of nowhere, just completely fine. That plant might be a plant that you want to look into for a Jadam herbal solution, for a, pesti a pesticidal solution. Okay. Um, a plant that is really healthy, you know, a grass or even a tomato or other plants that you can tell are really healthy, you can use that and for a fertilizer because you know that that plant has achieved pretty much homeostasis where it's gathered up all the nutrients that it needs in the correct proportions so that there's no way that you're going to be out of balance one way or the other. Okay, that totally makes sense. Yeah, a healthy plant is going to have the right ratios of everything in it to kind of give back. Okay, that makes sense. So if you're, you know, if you're taking deadish grass or, or deadish plants that aren't quite as healthy. You can tell they already have nutrient deficiencies. It's probably not going to be the best material to make something out of. Great, great point there. One of the, one of the things that I've always wondered or, you know, maybe struggled with, and again, back to the, you know, the WCA is how do you know, cause I, I can pick up my, you know, I can pick up my bottle, whether it's organic or whether it's synthetic mm -hmm. and read, okay, 8% nitrogen, 2% uh, calcium. When, when in a lot of these preparations, I'm not, I've, I've not found a clear answer on proper dosage yet. Like how, how do you kind of find that happy medium? Because again, the, the, the bottle isn't going to tell you necessarily what the concentration of it is. Or your you're solution. absolutely correct. Um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the preparations that you do do, and if you do pick up a, like the Jadam book or the Korean Natural Farming book, it will actually lay out all the math for you. And okay. it will be like, hey, if you use X amount of sulfur and you're using X amount of lye and X amount of water, you're going to end up with a 25% sulfur solution. Okay, so the math does exist. <clears throat> yeah, and then okay. so like the dilution rates are all there for people that don't want to have to go through that math process. If you follow the process that's in the book or that other people are putting out and then follow the dilution rate, it should be the correct uh, amount f for what you're trying to use. Okay. Now, the only difference on that is, is when you jump into like a Jadam liquid fertilizer, uh, nobody can really tell you how much is too much on that one because the plant that you may have chosen how long that Jadam liquid fertilizer has been brewing, per se. Um, the longer it sits, the stronger it gets on okay. a Jadam liquid fertilizer. So you can make some Jadam liquid fertilizer out of just grass clippings from your yard. Granted, uh, I would hope that your yard doesn't have a bunch of chemicals on it and you're not feeding it weed and feed and all kinds of junk. But um, you can use just the grass clippings and make a fertilizer out of that, let it sit for six months or so, and you can literally burn your plants by giving it too much. It, it has a massive amount of nutrients in it. Reading my mind once again. So yes, it is possible then to, to burn your plants using some of these ingredients, because that's a, a, a common misconception I think I hear a lot with uh, organic feeding and methods. Is like, it is a bunch harder. It. It's a bunch harder. I will say that, but if, if you're using, especially like a Jadam liquid fertilizer or a fish amino acid, those, especially those two things, you can definitely burn your plants with. And those, those will get stronger over time, you're saying then? Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what kind of shelf life do a lot of these mixes have? Because I, you know, again, 
I'll use a two gallon bucket of water maybe once every other day. So it's not huge. If I made a preparation, you usually want to make a preparation to make it worth your time. So you're not mm -hmm. just mixing up a little bit, but then I have this big jar of solution. Um, and I imagine, you know, it's going to depend on what the mixture is, but what is the kind of typical shelf life that you get out of, of these ingredients? Most the everything will last almost indefinitely. Okay. Um, especially like the, the sulfur or the water soluble calcium or the, the cal phosphorus or a, lo a lot of these different preparations, they'll last nearly forever. Okay. Um, but things where you're doing like the Jadam um, microorganism solution or like a compost tea or a labs, if you're making some labs that does not last forever, that, that lasts for maybe six months. Okay. Or a year. Um, and that's still a reasonably good shelf life, six months to a year. And labs, that was, I saw you did have a video on that one as well. Um, watch that, watch you making that. Um, and that's something that I've heard, you know, a lot of these people talk about. Some, sometimes it surprises me the, uh, you know, the, the, you hear the names, you hear the terms. And then, you know, again, I, I go to your channel and I watch the video and I'm like, Oh, well, he just made that seem so much more simple <laughs> than I really thought. What, what does it take to make something like a, a labs mix that you're going to have sitting around? Um, not a whole lot. If you have, uh, you know, a gallon of milk in the fridge, some rice in the cupboard and some clean water, you can make some labs right now. Um, all you're going to really do is take the rice and take some of the clean water and, you know, cover the rice with it and you're going to mix the rice around and make sure that water gets nice and uh, white and starchy from the rice. You're going to separate the rice from the water and put it in a, the best thing you can do is put it in a shallow um, container that's more wide than it is tall okay. and put a paper towel over that and you're going to wait a day or so and what's going to happen is, is um, yeasts and lactic acid bacteria that are just floating around in the air are gonna land in there and start colonizing um, that starch that's in that water. And once that happens, you're gonna get a, a slight, um, like sourdough slash sweet smell. Hmm. And okay. once that happens, you're gonna add that water, that rice wash water to milk. And the, the ratios really don't matter that much, but if you're trying to get the most out of it, you can use the rice wash water one part to 10 parts milk. Is, is this something that you would have to keep in the fridge afterwards or can you keep it on a shelf? Um, if you just mix it with the milk and let, let that ferment and, um, you know, you make, uh, you, you separate the curds in the whey and make sure you get all that separated, that will last in the fridge for like a month, month and a half. Okay. If you want it to last longer, you'll, you can mix equal parts by weight, brown sugar with it and what that's going to do is it's going to uh, create an osmotic pressure which basically means it's going to suck up all the water that's in that solution and it's going to make the microorganisms in that solution sporulate and, and make a bunch of babies pretty much to okay. try to protect its population okay. and once it does that they're going to be kind of suspended like a han solo in a you know suspended animation and once you add that back to some water, um, they'll reliven back up and you can use it. And that will last a, you know, quite a while. It's shelf stable, um, you know, keep it out of the sunlight. But other than that, it will last without refrigeration. Whoops. Okay. Um, let's see here. I was just trying to get to a comment here. Uh, <laughs> Robert, I'll put it up with the wrong heading here. Um, nope, that's the wrong one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a good point, Robert. The comments are going. There we go. I know. Oh, let's see here. I use pasta water for my labs. Um, I get kind of the same sheen on the water, uh, rinsing either rice or pasta. Is it kind of one or the other? Same difference? Uh, has it been anything you've tried or heard of before? Technically, you can definitely do it with the pasta. Uh, the only difference is, is that uh, the starches that are in rice are a little bit more complex and it's just okay. a term that, that complex carbohydrates 
Um, they're a little bit more complex so that the, the microorganisms uh, like them a little better. You get a more diverse set. Okay. And yeah, this was, this was something that also sold me uh, watching the labs video. You just mentioned the curds and whey, but you also get to make cheese curds for making labs. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a huge plus for me. I love the cheese. Cheese curds are great. Uh, but it's funny, you know, funny enough, I'll, you know, I make rice, I'll always rinse my rice. And this is another thing while watching your video, I'm like, dude, I'm already kind of doing, doing part this. of this. I just yeah. need to do the, you know, the next step. And that's, you know, it's fairly simple for me to do. So might play around. And a lot that. of times, <clears throat> a lot of times we like to use rice as well, because after we rinse that rice, we'll usually just cook that rice to like a more al, al dente style where it's a little kind of crunchy. And we'll use that for going out to the forest to collect IMOs. How, how, oh, do you, does the right, you put the rice out there and then it gets inoculated with spores? Pretty and much. It, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, no, no like sterilization or clean precautions on that. You can just kind of put a little rice chunk outside by a tree, let it do its thing and then bring it back in. Yeah. Or how does that work? There's, a, there's slight precautions. Uh, Usually when you're doing an IML collection, you're using a couple of pounds of rice so that uh, you, get, you make it worth your time, basically. You're not trying to go collect a small sample like right. this because it's going to take four or five days for you to do this. Okay. Um, so you're usually doing a couple of pounds and usually doing a few different collection sites. And you'll make some small boxes and they can be crafted from nearly anything, straw, you know, bamboo, wood. You, you make some boxes that are closed off on all the sides but open on top and the bottom. Okay. And on the bottom, you will you can put like stainless steel screen or some more wood, but making sure that you have open slats so that things can grow up into it. Okay. And then on the top, you're gonna maybe have a little bit of a screen material, a, a hardware cloth, and you're gonna put the rice inside this box, go out to the, the forest, find some you know, leaf mold soil that's underneath some old trees and you're going to put it you know, right there maybe put some leaves on top of it so that maybe some of the leaf mold soil microorganisms will fall through and onto that rice um, and you're going to let it sit there for a few days now hopefully it doesn't rain you might want to um, put a tarp over it if you, it rains in the forecast um, mm -hmm. you also might want to put um, put it inside a small bit of hardware cloth the entire thing if you have a lot of rodents around the rodents might come around and yeah and just take the right hey meal <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> well you, you had mentioned with the uh um gosh yes it was the labs um you, you mentioned with that uh you would prefer to have a shallower but wider container for it i'm assuming just more surface area more air can Correct. get in and inoculate that. Um, does the same kind of go with the rice when you're putting that out mm -hmm. there? You you want more surface area than depth, basically. Correct. Yeah, you want okay. you want at least like maybe two or three inches of depth on the rice, but other than that, you want you want it wider okay. than it is tall. So something like even like a, a, a cookie pan or something that would probably mm -hmm. be ideal. You line the bottom of the cookie pan and then just kind of put some in there. And then, like I said, hopefully you go around to a few different spots, not like crazy far distances, but, you know, a few hundred feet left or right and get a few different samples. And that way you can bring back um, a whole bunch of different indigenized microorganisms that will help out your farm. And you're getting, uh, I'm trying to, I know that's one of the, uh, one of the principles or one of the practices focuses real heavily on your local uh, mycelium or organisms and everything there is that kind of relating to, to what you're doing you're looking for the natural you know some even the mycelium in that mm -hmm. soil in those in that leaf matter that you have around you're you're taking that to and bringing that into the garden as well absolutely um a lot of the a lot of what we're going after in these IMO collections are a lot of the fungi because a lot of the fungi is what we're missing in most soils. Okay. And the fungi is what breaks down the quickest um, wood. It breaks down different amendments the quickest. They're, 
there's a fungi called sapphiritic, uh, sapphiritic fungi, which are their main goal in life is to decompose things. Okay. And, and turn it into plant available food, pretty much. That's their main goal. And <clears throat> that's what we're going after a lot of times when we're going after um, IMO collections. That would be a good one, a good one to have around. How, you know, it sounds like, because again, you, you can make a lot of these I'm preparations uh, to last you a while. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it sounds like to me, you know, oh, it takes, you know, a lot of time to do these things. But once it's done, it's done. Where, mm -hmm. where does that, where do you think that fits in um, to like a gardener's schedule? Is it, is it really that as time intense as I think it might be? Or is it really just, you know, half an hour here, half an hour there, do that for a week or two, and then you're ready to go for your yeah. whole cycle? It pretty much, uh, I mean... It is a little time intensive, I won't lie. It is a little time intensive, but what you're trading for your time is money. And, and that's the, the giant battle of life. Um, yeah. Granted, uh, you're saving a whole lot of money by trading your time. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's more advantageous for you to purchase these materials because you make more money and your time's more valuable, th that's totally your, your call, you know what I'm saying? Um, at, but it doesn't take too long because once you do get the systems in place, yes, it might take you a couple of weeks. I will, I'll even say it might even take you a couple of weeks of working on it daily to get these systems set up and get them through your mind and be like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to do this. Now, it might take you a minute to set that plan up. But once that plan is set up and those systems are set up, it's going to take you a couple hours a, a weekend. Okay. And, you know, probably like with anything, the first and the second time is going to take you twice as long as the third and the fourth time. So you mm -hmm. just, you, you get, you get your method and you get your practice. So that's, that's good. That's good to know. Um, uh, I think this uh, style of growing appeals to a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of good reasons for it. Have you noticed yourself a tremendous impact or even a little impact in regards to and these are all separate things too sometimes mm -hmm. they don't always correlate but you know yield is usually one thing um for usually those people that aren't concerned with yield are usually concerned about their tastes and their smells mm -hmm. um have you noticed significant benefit from the system that you're doing compared to what you may have done in the past or a buddy you know that's doing it differently uh do, do you perceive do you get the difference i do I, and personally i do now granted there are really really great um, mineral based growers out there that can pull off really awesome grows that taste fire it's fire product um but for me it's always been like i said easier to get those similar results in an organic system that might not be uh, for everybody though Consistent. For me, it's easier to get the, that consistency and those results that I'm looking for in an organic system. Granted, I have been studying organic growing for quite some time, but I, I do firmly believe that as a, a beginner, if you're looking to get really fire product off rip without having to um, worry too much about, oh, did I do too much PPMs? Did I overwatch it? With all the different variables that come with a mineral base, you, you might get slightly less yield as a new organic beginner grower, but that's going to be really, really fire smoke for you. And consistency is a huge thing, particularly when it comes down to medicine and as a care provider. Um, you know, when you're providing medicine for somebody else, uh, you can't or you shouldn't have variability in batch to batch to batch mm -hmm. um you know if you if you mess up you're going to lose some, some terpenes or you're going to lose particular cabin cannabinoids and maybe those were what was hitting it right for the patient so mm -hmm. uh, smart man having having a, a you know a program where you're able to get those consistent results from so i i totally see the wisdom in that and again as, as a care provider that's a huge thing um, something that you're not going to find on the recreational market. Uh, I hope you're listening, Michigan. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah. care, care providers all the way. Uh, what, uh, you know, what are some of the things that you look for in the plants that you grow or in the strains that you choose? Is it a uh, yield? Is it a flavor? Is it a duration? What, what kind of draws you to certain things? Well, a bunch of things, honestly. Um, yeah. the, the first off, it's going to be flavor. First is going to be flavor. That's what's going to draw my attention to that plant first. And then it's going to be, well, does it grow well? What kind of vigor does it have? Can it really kind of support itself without too much uh, extra help? Some plants that like to be a little spindly you know, than others. And some you, you can you know, maybe pump the silica up a little bit and it'll help with that. But some you're just going to have to get, do a bunch of support with that plant. Um, then after that, I go and look at yield. Okay. First, right. it's taste, how it grows, then yield. Do you have a, a particular flavor palette that you shoot for? I shoot for variety, and I'm a, I imagine you mm -hmm. do too, but I definitely have my favorites. Uh, oh, yeah. I have my favorites as well. Um, don't get me wrong. I love the super gassy strains that make you choke when you hit them and all that, but I really, I really still like the smoother strains that... Mm -hmm. You know, like they're fruitier, they're, you know, they have a little the nuance on the taste, basically. And then yeah. I also really like, like, you know, the earthy, piney taste as well. So, <clears throat> you know, all the, the whole spectrum I like, honestly, but uh, I'll more often than not, I'm going towards the more smooth, fruity, um, really good tasting smoke because that happens to be the smoke that, uh, helps me calm down, helps me go to sleep, helps me manage symptoms I'm trying to manage. Yeah, I, uh, I'm swinging back towards that way too. I, I, I go back and forth. Typically, it's whatever isn't the trend at the moment. Um, <laughs> and that's not by design. That's just a weird habit. I was into, you know, like super fruity stuff uh, 12 years ago when everything was OG. Uh, so I did my thing there and then everything kind of started getting fruity and I'm like, ah, I like the OG now, but, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back around. I need some more, uh, limonene in my life. Um, I've just found, uh, for me, a lot of those strains are better for daytime. Uh, they leave my head a little bit clearer. They leave my energy level where it needs to be, but it mm. also kind of takes the edge off of some of the, the, the pain or the, you know, the mental aspects that I'm using it for. So. I do like that. I've got uh, right now, what am I hunting? A, uh, I've got one of my, my blends in there. I know that's going to come out <laughs> fire. Uh, but also there's a Sunday Fun Day in there that I picked up. Uh, it's a sour tangy, or no, sour diesel. Sour tangy times mimosa. That's what it is. Nice. So I'm hoping for something, you know, I really liked the mimosa, uh, that it's, that's a love it or hate it strain because it's so in your face, you're either going to like the, the orange to it or not. Um, but I <laughs> liked it and that's what I'm going for there. So that's what I've got in one of the ones that I've got in my garden right now, but I know you've got a, uh, a garden lurking around there somewhere. Oh, yeah. Did you want to uh, possibly give everybody a little bit of tour of that beauty? Oh, absolutely. We can, uh, we can do that and we'll switch over. Awesome. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go ahead and do that. We'll switch over here and put a Chem D all day stew moo, my man. Uh, I will never give up on the chems. I just recently popped some chem. Well, they're, it's ironically... It's called Twin Peaks. Uh, fresh baked. Uh, I'm going to give him a shout out soon. But uh, let's see here. I'll go to a different screen. Let's see here. I'll remove you there. Hopefully, I'm not ending it. Okay. Go to this screen. Let's go big on him, not on me. I am so boring. <laughs> Let's see, drag and drop. Hey, yo, there we go. All right. I'm still in the picture. There it is. Bigger. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. So you, you can hear me fine and everything's good on your Oh, own. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, you're, yeah. You're looking good there. So what do we got so here? here yep. Go for it. Is, uh, is the veg area. Uh, got quite a few of the black cherry cheesecake that uh, 
I grow I grow that pretty uh pretty a lot like almost every grow I have at least eight of these black cherry cheesecake. Nice. What what kind the, of uh flavors do you pull off of that? It sounds like a wonderful dessert. Uh, it is. Um it, it's like a black like without a doubt like a black cherry soda with like a floral aftertaste, the floral undertone. Awesome. Awesome. And they, uh, yeah, they just got into these uh, seven gallon pots. I don't know, maybe a week ago. What what size do you start everything in? Um, everything usually starts in a, a deep water culture cloner, or if it's a bean, obviously I'll just start it in a small pot. But usually uh, I'm in like little solos mm-hmm. until I go directly into the five or seven gallon, preferably seven gallons. Okay. And do you, you know, we were talking blue mats earlier. Uh, are you hand watering these smaller containers or are these going to get a stick as well? Oh, yeah. All these are hand watered um, as well as uh, all the plants on the little table here. It's uh, clones that literally come out of the cloner, I don't know, five or six days ago. And I okay. just put them in uh, solo cups yep. and let them get established and, you know, make their connection with the soil basically. Mm-hmm. And at this point, probably tomorrow, I'm going to have to transplant all these into uh, larger pots as well. <laughs> and the work never stops. <laughs> oh, never, never. And then, uh, like on the far right here, these are all Night Terror OG clones. And uh, right now, I got one, three, three Night Terrors that are flowering, are flowering out in the flower room right now. So but, do, uh, you, do you usually go, um, you know, I, in the past, I would always go at least three runs of a particular strain before I decided to oh, eat yeah. it or chuck it. Do you do something similar? I, I at least do two, yeah, at least do two or three, unless like, it's very prevalent that I'm not going to like that strain ever. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's funny you mentioned that I have one right now in the flower room that I reluctantly put in there because something else <laughs> turned out to have balls. Uh, uh, I'm never going to grow this strain again in my life. I, oh, fuck. I'm probably going to, uh, I'm gonna, well, okay. So back to yours, <laughs> back to your plants. Uh, so, then, okay. Uh, so you do, you do run, uh, them a few times to get a good choice. Of oh, absolutely. Okay. And usually the first time, uh, uh, I run something, I'll do no training on it. I'll do nothing to it. I'll run it just the way it is, like it grows. And then yeah. The second time, I'll maybe do some training on it and see what it likes. And by that time, by the third time I'm growing it, I know exactly what that plant likes and whether or not I'm keeping it. Man, we uh, they jo- they were joking at the beginning of the episode that we might be brothers, but I'm starting to think we might be separated at birth. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I, okay, here's, here's the, the question to see if you are or not. Are you growing any cookies? Uh, not currently. We might be related. <laughs> That's a trick question. No, everything I got is like OGs, Cushes. Uh, that's pretty much it. OGs and Cushes. Good selection. And do you said, do you start a lot of these from seed? Or are you able to, to get clones in the area that you're at? Um, a lot of these are started from seed. Uh, the only one that... Um, is a clone that I started from a clone is this one right here. This is a blue grape mother. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I got a bunch of blue grape clones over here as well. And I ended up getting blue grape right, right when I started right at the beginning of growing oh, right wow. at the beginning of medical here. So this plant's been around since Oh seven, Oh eight. Wow. Just that's, being a clone. Wow. That's a, that's a great, that must be a really good strain. Because it takes up space, and when space is limited, you only keep the great stuff. And that's a long time to keep something. So it must be hitting the oh, right buttons for you. It hits the right buttons for me, that's for sure. It's a, It's got Blue Dream in it, and then, and then it's also got Grit, and it's got Blueberry in it. Nice. Great lineage there. So, And the, the grapefruit is pretty prevalent. It, when you smoke it, it you, it's like... It'll make your mouth pucker up a little bit like you drank some grapefruit juice. Awesome. 
Awesome. That's a that's a that's a magical strain. That's special, man. That's not uh, generic tasting at all. I love to get those expressions. And and I see some then, aloe back in there too. Oh yeah. That's your. I got a little. Uh, yep. Yeah, got a little bed here, growing uh, three or four uh, aloe plants in here, and along with an plant. ivy plant. That's just for something to look at. But uh, the aloe, I, you can see I cut off pieces of it, and I, uh, mm -hmm. I use it in gardening. Nice. Perfect supply again, supplying your own, or taking care of your own needs there. It's, it's a great way to Absolutely. be. Absolutely, and I bought, I bought, I think, all three of these for three bucks. <laughs> and yeah. they've just been growing since, and I've never had to buy aloe again. Awesome. With your uh, strain that you've been having going since around 2007, I'm assuming you're going to go clone from clone. Are you doing a mother in between time? Or, and if so, how long do you keep that mother before you kind of rejuvenate that? I usually keep moms close to a year, maybe a little longer than a year. Okay. And then uh, I end up just taking one of the clones that I take off that mom and using that as a new mom. Nice. Yeah, that's. Uh, I've always kind of gone clone to clone. Uh, we just love the grapefruit cultivars. Mm -hmm. yeah, not bad at all. And then uh, I just took this down a little bit ago. Oh, boy. Nice. This is uh, three pink kush plants that I took down with uh, Lantern and I. Okay. How, uh, and, how many days does that flower out, the pink kush? Is that a 60 day or 70 day? That's a little longer one, honestly. Uh, yeah, I'd say 70, 72. For a kush, it's a little longer. Yeah. What, what are you doing to kind of monitor your conditions in there? Because that's, I mean, it looks like you have a lot of space, which is good. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're sealing it up, that's still going to create kind of a, a microclimate inside. Oh, absolutely. I got. I do have one small fan here blowing out the uh, vent at the bottom of the tent. And then I do have um, one of the vents at the top of the tent open. Okay. So it is passively drawing air in from there. And I am uh, monitoring the temperature and humidity with uh, one of my own sensors that I made. And uh, returns the information back to a Raspberry Pi. Nice. And uh, I can pull it up on my computer and, and check on everything. That's awesome. Yeah, you have a lot of uh, technical aspects to you, too. A lot of uh, behind-the-cameras type <laughs> type stuff, which people may or may not know about. But, uh, yeah, I like the technical aspect. What is that one in the very front in the, like, tan? This one right here? Yeah, what, what is that? This is actually a, a baby bamboo plant. Oh, okay. And... Is that going to go outside, or...? Is it more uh, of a mascot? It's more of a mascot. Uh, it'll die going outside here in Michigan. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it's like a it's like a subtropical plant. So <laughs> yes. we put it outside in Michigan, and it ain't gonna have a good time. It's not winter hardy. <laughs> no, no. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it's just a a nice plant. My mom ended up getting it for you know like a house plant and whatnot, and then it grew too tall for the where she had it so i'm like ah we'll just throw it down here yeah. and keep it alive I'm i did sure. end up having to top it and okay. you can see right there okay. yep and then it, it grew more another bamboo shoot and uh wow. just continue to grow basically It'd be interesting after a little while just to take the take the root ball out to see what the root ball has done because some some bamboo loves to spread others will just stay shallow but uh mm -hmm. in a pot like that i wonder what the root system is going to do over time it'd be interesting to me i because i haven't kept it in a pot like that for too long yeah I, it's been in that pot for probably eight months okay so it's yeah. definitely spent some time in that pot yeah one of the things I'm noticing here too is you have the the green drip pans under there. Um, mm -hmm. I love you know the light colored floors. I'm I'm very into like white or light colored floors because it lets you see everything. Um, oh, absolutely. There's not a ton of 
dirt and perlite and all that laying around there. So, you know, hats off to cleanliness. That is my number one IPM strategy. Oh, absolutely. Um, but something a lot of growers are going to come into here shortly. I'm already starting to, to have the weather change on me. Um, it looks like a concrete floor. And when the weather goes yep. down, you know, the root zone is going to typically be colder than the top of your canopy. And sometimes if you're measuring the top of the canopy, the, the you know, temperature is good, but you're starting to get deficiencies or it's not drinking as fast. Mm -hmm. You know, just for the, you know, viewers out there, now is a good time to start paying attention to the temperature of your root zone because we're probably going to start seeing some issues with colors and whatnot. So what do you Absolutely. do having it sitting on the concrete floor? What do you do to try to kind of combat some of the cold that can come up through a concrete floor? Well, uh, being in Michigan, it can get very, very cold, but a good benefit of being in a basement okay. is that it won't ever really get below 50. Yep. So it, it's more of you, you have a constant temperature that you're always having to work around, which is a lot easier than something that's, uh, you know, swinging from day to day. It could be really high one day or really low the next. So I don't have to do a whole lot. And an, mm -hmm. a, another reason I don't have to worry too much about it is I have entirely too many lights down here for my floor <laughs> to get cold. Yeah, right. Good problem. Good problem. And so I'm, I'm spending a little on electricity, but, uh, you know, the, the floor is definitely not too cold. Yep. And, and good point. That, again, goes back to our environmental thing. I, I do remember, you know, when I lived in Michigan, we had the basement. That was my, like, play area. That was, you know, that was Nirvana was the basement. I moved out west. Nobody has basements out here. Uh, we're in earthquake territory, so basements aren't the Oh, best. yeah. So, yeah, automatically when I see concrete floor, I think of a garage because nobody out here has basements. But uh, oh, the yeah. basement. Oh, out here basement, in Michigan, I'm underground. <laughs> yeah. And then that's how, you know, that's how root cellars work. Uh, ideally, you know, that's not a bad system to do it. Uh, if, particularly if you do live in like cold areas, dig underground, get that constant temperature and then maintain it from there. So, all right. Cold floors, not necessarily an issue for you there. Um, but for our West Coast friends, anybody, if you're in the garage on a concrete floor, that wind's going to blow in through the cracks. It's going to make it cold. Keep an eye oh, on yeah. the root zone temperatures before it's too late. All right, what do we got over here? This is my, uh, I call it a side tent because it's not running all the time. Mm -hmm. But when I have a couple of extra plants, I end up uh, putting them in here. Cool, okay. I do the it's same just thing. about to turn on in about 10 minutes. So opening this up isn't going to freak it out too bad or nothing. Yeah, I've, I've wondered that sometimes it takes me, you know, sometimes there's 10 or 15 minutes like this morning. My my lights were off for 15 minutes before I got in there and closed the door. Um, yeah. Life, it being that 10 or 15 minutes off, yeah, it, it's not going to be too crazy. As, as long as it's getting around the same DLI every day, mm -hmm. that that's what's going to really matter. And it looks like a HPS that you're running in there, is it? My watt? very, very last uh, 600 watt. Okay. So, and 600 very last watt, HPS. Yep, 600 watt is the more efficient of them all as far as return on your on your on your power bill. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a good one to have in there. And what what strains are we looking at in here now? Uh, this is uh, Armstrong. Armstrong, did it stretch? It does stretch pretty well. Uh, I will say that like. Uh, these uh, six clones here are Armstrongs as well, mm -hmm. and after I transplant them, and they they make they might stay two maybe three weeks in that transplanted pot before they get flipped because they like to stretch. Okay, that's yeah, and then when you're dealing with uh, limited headspace and you know intense lighting like that, uh, I've learned you know through experience you got to be able to map that out and uh, flip it at the appropriate time. Because, yeah. Yeah, this one here is nearly as tall as me. Wow. Okay. Well, it's looking good in there, and it's got, you know, a few more weeks left to go, you're saying? Oh, yeah. There's probably three weeks in. Okay. 
Wow, looking looking great in there. Loving that loving that light. Doesn't look like it's hooked up uh, to any like air cooling there. Do you just let no. it marinate in the tent, or are you venting the tent with a big fan? I am uh, or... venting the tent. Uh, I do have a quite dirty carbon filter there in the back, but uh, <laughs> it's pulling hot air out from the you know the top. And throwing it right out the house. And then on the bottom here, I have this uh, side vent open. And it's passively uh, pulling that air in. Perfect. And you'll yeah. actually notice like uh, when I close this tent that it, it goes under quite, quite a bit of negative pressure. Okay. And that's, you know, a good point, too. I've never, it, in my tents here, I've never really bothered with an intake fan, per se, just because of the volume of the tent and the output of my fan that's exhausting it. It basically creates its own passive intake through the, through the side vent. So, yeah, that's nice and taut there. It's, it's amazing, just a little four-inch fan even sitting in the, the glove of one of those top things can cycle out the yep. air in, in a good enough manner to, to, you know, air movement is key. And I even have, it's a pretty decently long run, which is something you don't really want to do when you're doing air ducting. Yeah. And that's probably, I don't know, a 20 foot run. Yeah, it's long, but you're not snaking it around a ton of corners. So that is going to help you there. And that's just going right out the, the window there. Nice. nice. Gosh, I miss basements. <laughs> <laughs> An electrical wall. Yep. And so other than, then, you know, I see, oh, you had the uh, reflective material up there. Oh, yeah. Yep. Was that, that's just a sheet material that you were able to purchase and put up? Yeah, yeah. This is actually a... Vivo Sun Mylar material. Okay. Um, you can get it in a roll. I got it on Amazon myself. It was about ninety dollars for the roll, but uh, it it covered this whole area, uh, and I definitely I don't know I got like a half a roll left. Oh wow! Okay. So That's... if you do buy if you do buy the ninety dollar roll, it's going to last you a minute. You'd be able to cover quite a bit of space with it. And that's good because that basically allows you to almost turn everything into a grow room. You just got to put that up yeah. on the walls. And the reflective stuff makes more of a difference than uh, some people might imagine. Oh, it makes quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of difference. Like uh, you could be losing up to 40% of the photons that you're throwing out there by mismanaging them. Yep. Let's see. We have a request from Mad Hemp God here. He says, "Go to the fancy flower room." <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll stop in there in just a second. This is the uh, other tent that I got. We got the, the AC Infinity tent, and this is one I just use for propagation. Okay, is, uh, that's your clone machines there, and is that a, a clone yep. machine that you've made yourself? Indeed, it is. Yeah, it's just a simple deep water culture cloner. Um, and I bought some of the, the foam collars mm -hmm. and uh, used, a, I think it was, yeah, one and a half inch hole saw and just drilled some holes in these uh, Sterilite containers. Yep. That's and, perfect. Uh, and do you have a little, uh, like, a fish pump in there or something to bubble the water? A little bit, a little bit more. Uh, it's a more of a, I guess you would say, a commercial pump. That's what they call it, at least. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and that uh, has, like, a five or six output valve oh, there yep oh we yeah we i see that i you we use those at our commercial facility so yep totally know what you're talking yeah, about yeah. Right there and then uh yeah i, I used to use that one because i got fed up with uh spending 10 15 20 bucks on these little air pumps that hardly put out any air and they die in a week and it's like uh yeah my so advice is just go for the 50 dollar pump off rip that's my advice yeah, go buy it right once instead of buying it wrong three or four times. You spend the same. Uh, my yeah. my money pit is fans. I've bought so many different styles of fans, but uh, yeah, buy it right, guys. Yeah, we got a nice. Let there be. Ooh. Let there be light. Holy cow! Let there be light and lots of goodness in there. Immediate thought. I love how you have everything spaced. You give yourself aisles. You're not crazy. Yes, I can walk. That helps with IPM. That helps you get your eye on it. It helps with air movement. 
bravo for not being me and stuffing every square inch. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually one of the night terrors I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's praying. That looks, yeah, that looks nice and sharp. Almost you put an eye out on that thing. <laughs> And it's got a lot of, you know, it's got some nice long branches. Um, sometimes under, you know, like heavy wind or even heavy bud set, there might be some issues with them wanting to fall over. Everything mm -hmm. is looking nice and sturdy and strong there. Is there anything that you kind of do, whether it's nutrient-wise or training-wise, to, to give it strength and support? Or is that just coming down to genetics? Uh, mainly coming down to genetics, but I also don't baby them. Like, I'll, I'll walk like, in here, hit it, hit it. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, and the fans, the fans are blow, them out, blow them around pretty well, as, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it builds up that lignin inside the plant and helps it keep it a little bit more stable. But it's mostly genetics. Excellent. It's good OG. I know sometimes, sometimes with OGs, they can get a little bit wiry. Um, not the problem. Not a problem there, though. And it looks like you have these some... ones are a little bit more. Yep. Why really? Yep. Okay, you got the bam the bamboo stake of death going. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's what I like calling them. Uh, Wear eye protection, people. If you got bamboo sticks out. Yep. Definitely little foam balls. I heard somebody say marshmallows once, even. Uh, that would work until I get stoned and start defoliating. <laughs> just pull them off and I'll eat pop it. Yep. Them out. And then uh, this is a black cherry cheesecake, mm. this entire row. Looks so good. <laughs> so good. And uh, most of these lights are uh, HLG of some sort, other than this entire uh, row here. Mm -hmm. um, this, these are from uh, the Medic Row Company. That's uh, Fold 8, and that's the Easy 8. No. Uh, and they call them eight because they have eight bars on them. Okay. Have you found a preference? Both of these. Oh, go ahead. Both of these lights are crazy, crazy powerful uh, and efficient. If uh, anybody grabs these lights for a 4x4 four four or 5x5 five five space, they may have to run it dimmed the entire time, which is not really a huge problem because you're going to save a little bit more money on your electricity, and it will, uh, you know, it will save the light for future use because it's going to run a little bit cooler and therefore the leds are going to last much longer yeah very true i like to tell people to overbuy. you can then dim it down you can extend the life of it or if you expand you don't necessarily have to run out and get a new piece of gear because your gear that you bought has room yep. to grow still uh, again, just coming down to economics of things. These these lights have come down in price dramatically, but there still is a a, a step up from um, you know kind of the basic lights into some more advanced or commercial lighting styles. Oh, absolutely. This the um, Easy Eight is a uh, six hundred and sixty nine dollars. Okay. And the uh, Fold Eight is a uh, six fifty five, I believe it is. But uh, I got a discount code. A lot of content creators are starting to get uh, discount codes. So, I mean, you can start getting these lights for like 500, 590 bucks. Wow. Which That's is awesome. starting to get pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah, I've noticed uh, lately that there's there's been a lot more push. In the last week, I've been hit up by Mars Hydro, Spider mm -hmm. Farmer, and um, God, one, one other, Vivo Sun Lighting Company. Ah. Uh, basically offering to toss out free lights and I'm not interested uh, in their deal. But yeah, it does seem like right now there seems to be a big push of trying to get a lot of lights out to people and into the hands of people who do, you know, shows or, you know, I hate the term, but influencers. Um, yep, yep. So I always, you know, say to everybody listening, you know, do your homework. Um, definitely listen to some of these people online, see the results that they're getting. But take with a grain of salt all the positive reviews because most people doing a light video got that light for free. So I'll just oh, absolutely, and and full full disclosure, I got both of those lights absolutely free. Awesome. Yeah, they're and they're full great disclosure. lights though. <laughs> 
Yeah, no worries. Oh, but they are great lights. I did uh, run a power test underneath them. They're putting out, like I said, the crazy amount of light for the price, and they're super efficient for the price as well. Uh, like, a lot of people have to turn them down because at 1,500 PPFD, you're going to have to start running CO2 yep. if, you're, if you're on a 4x4. So they're, they're definitely uh, with some super powerful lights for price. price. That, that's, what I can, that's what I can say about them so far. Yep. And, and that's good too. You know, that's, that's, I guess I could maybe clarify my, my little rant a little bit more. Uh, you know, a grower like yourself, a grower like me, many other growers out there, we've been growing particular strains in a particular system for a certain way. So when we add in oh, a yeah. piece of kit like that, you know, again, first run, I'll say, okay, that's interesting. Second run, I'll kind of get my decision. Third, you know, third run, I'll be like, this is what it's doing. Um, Yep. But yeah, proof proof is in the pudding. So, you know, again, the, the people who get the light and two weeks later saying that it's the best thing, they'll never use anything else again, I don't listen to that crap. Um, somebody in your case where, or, you know, other cases, you, you've got a light, where you're a competent grower, where it's obvious you're going to be able to distinguish the difference. If you've gone through three or four runs with something and you really enjoy it, that I'm absolutely going to listen to. Because proof, proof is in the pudding, but I'll I'll wrap up that little rant there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. For instance, like uh, this used to be a um, T five light. What? Yep. Wow. You'll probably notice the the Enviro Grow and the you know the really? Hydro Farm warning. This wow. is not a Hydro Farm light anymore. I took that completely apart and uh, put a bunch of quantum boards in there. That's and uh, nice. mounted the drivers on top. Interesting. Have you ever considered doing that? I thought, you know, again, we a lot of us have old HPS hoods sitting around. I yep. had almost thought about at one point just putting the lights in there um, just for maybe a little bit of directionality on the light that's coming off of it to focus it, but never, never went that route. But interesting that... Interesting you did that. I like that. Repurposing. Yeah. No, repurposing, yeah. I, I think it cost me two, 250 bucks to build that light. Nice. And it's <laughs> definitely going to produce more than $250 worth of uh, uh, medicine. So that's all. Oh, ab nice. oh absolutely. It's a 500-watt light. Um, you know, 3,500K full spectrum. And, uh, you know. That was that puts yeah. out about a thousand power. Oh wow! Okay, and I mean everything looks happy under everything in there looks happy. Are you using any sort of mixed spectrum in there, or is it all kind of the uh, what we know as white light these days? Yeah, it, it, it's all what we know as white light per se. I will say that the two medic grow lights are a little bit cooler of a white light. Mm -hmm. They they got a little higher bump in the blue than the HLGs. Okay. Okay. Makes these sense. uh these all these quantum boards are HLGs. Even the ones I built right there, I just I built or I bought the boards from HLG and put them together. The the light over to the right there in the center now, is that like a cob style or is that a quantum board as well? It's an interesting light that the HLG put out a little while ago called the uh, 360 Elite. Huh, I have not heard and of that. It's kind of blowing out the camera. But uh, it's supposed to uh, completely replace the 600 watt HPS while using 360 watts. Okay. And it's two um, highly densely packed LED boards on each side of the light. Okay. So it's not quite like a Cobb style, but it's the same style. Just Correct. Very, very and densely that, packed. <laughs> They uh, they made these QB yeah they're, they're called QB ninety six boards for that exact purpose is that so people who already built in the DIY scene mm -hmm. uh, cob lights they could reuse their uh, heat sinks and reuse their drivers reuse a lot of the stuff that they already purchased while building their light but they'd be able to upgrade to a newer technology that's a little bit more efficient. Nice that's, than a that's... cob. That's smart of them. That's that might be a, a section of the market that a lot of people are missing. I like that. So yeah, like you can definitely uh, get those uh, QB96 boards and put them on your own uh, pen heat sinks, 
let's say you, you made a couple of cob lights, you know, two, three, four years ago, and you're you're trying to replace them. Mm -hmm. That might be a a cheap way to upgrade your lighting. Yeah, that, that would be a good way to do it. I'm just looking in chat here, everybody. Everybody is enjoying your garden. Uh, let's see here. It looks like we got a question. It says, how often are you looking at the data that you collect? Uh, any major changes you did which were informed by data? Um, I usually check the data you know, once a day at least. Um, and then uh, like the historical data, I'll check probably, I don't know, once every couple of weeks. And I'll look over a longer period of time. Um, but the the biggest inference you can make is from being able to collect all that data is being able to either prevent um, pest and disease issues or identify when those pest and disease issues started. Hindsight, that is a uh, good thing to have. Yeah, I guess you could kind of, because again, sometimes, it's, especially with deficiencies and you know, bugs are kind of the same way, you don't really notice the problem until it's two or three weeks into the problem. And yep. yeah, with, with good data and hindsight, you can almost start to predict those in the future. For instance, I wouldn't have known, uh, if, like a lot of these black cherries, you can tell are kind of faded out. And technically they shouldn't be that faded out right now. They, they got a little bit to go. But the, the reason I know why they got faded out is because I had that data I could collect and that I seen that the PPMs of the CO2 got all the way down to 200 parts per million. Well, these, you know, really strong HLG lights were even closer to the canopy. So they were, they're having no CO2 and they're having tons of light. So they, you know, they got stressed out. They got, you know, a little hungry per se because they couldn't process the food because there was no CO2. And that, that's what ended up happening. And without that data, I would have been like, well, I don't know what happened. Uh, nutrient deficiency. Uh, I overwatered too many times. Uh, I don't know what happened. But with that data, now I can go, oh, uh, 200 parts per million CO2 and 1,500 par is going to do some stuff to your plants. Yeah, gosh. So, such valuable information to have and it, it really takes discipline to to keep up on that uh i like I'm, I'm very good in the beginning keeping my data points but as things i almost get bored with flower in the last three weeks because so there's really not i, I hear you for it, you to do <laughs> i hear you. that's why i started creating my own you know raspberry pi system to where i just keep track for me because i'm like just keep track for me and i'll look at the data thanks because nice. that's, that's getting boring, you know. Yeah, well, I will definitely have to talk to you afterwards and, and learn a little bit more about that because that might be something that would benefit me or that I could implement into my system there. And I see you've kind of frozen on the screen. I don't know if you're going back to the other room or not, but uh, we got us. Oh, I think I hear you again. Yep, there you are. Or we're. Oh, that's a glorious room. So appreciate that. And we're probably just having a little bit of a reception issues going back and forth from one location to another. But chat, what up chat? Uh, it's been fun watching you guys. And I've been loving your inputs. And oh, he's gone. He might come back here on the other screen. Let me add this in. Holy cow, that looked halfway professional. Like I know what I'm doing transition like a motherfucker all right welcome back green goblin and thank you for that grow tour that was very awesome uh that you know that room is kind of something like my dreams where it's nice and clean i have enough space to do various things and you know there's different sections it it looks like you're able to you know perpetually flower in there it doesn't have to mm -hmm. all be set into flower at one point you could bring them in as they're ready oh absolutely i have that uh, that tent that was in there it's completely empty that's where i just took the uh three of the pink kush out of and in a little bit i'll end up taking the black cherry cheesecake and a little bit later i'll take the night terror and yeah well, it is quite convenient being able to have uh, like 
rows like that where you can be like well this is going to be black cherry cheesecake and this one's going to be this plant this one's going to be this plant and that way you can have the lights you know a nice even canopy you're not trying to do too many strains in one location it definitely uh, streamlines stuff it definitely does um <clears throat> Oh, I just blanked on my question too. Dang it. Damn. It was a good one. Um, <laughs> crap. Yeah, I totally, I totally blocked that. I was looking for uh, Uncle Rick here in chat. He, he was big upping your garden. And I was like, oh, I need to oh, put nice. that one up because, yeah, that's a nice. Ah, there we go. He's all fixed. Dang it. Well, leveling mm -hmm. up, eh? That's a good one. Didn't mean to click on that one, but thanks for the tour. Oh, yeah. not a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you for the tour um, that I think is going to give a lot of people a good idea of different things that they can do. It's going to put a lot of, you know, a proof in the pudding, the, the education that you have given yourself over the years by finding these resources has worked. The organic system for you is working. It doesn't have to all be synthetic to get great looking plants. And that's something that yeah. you, you've you've done very well there. So I appreciate that. Thank you Thank for taking you. us into into the garden. Um, uh, kind of along those lines, uh, we you know we talked a little bit about uh, Chris Trump earlier. Uh, we talked mm -hmm. about Matt Powers, who I'm a huge fan of. You, you can find uh, he's got a few episodes here on Future Cannabis Project. He also has the uh, that book that he rejuvenating. Wrote. Yep, rejuvenating soil. I bought the. Uh, uh, the teacher's edition to that one, mm -hmm. which uh, on Amazon, it's a great deal here. I'm not, again, he didn't send it to me. I'm not sponsored, whatever. I just, I bought it too. Yeah. It, it, it's good information. <laughs> and the thing I loved about the teacher uh, edition, other than a phone ringing, um, <laughs> gosh, dang, let's see. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. That I loved about that is, <sighs> <laughs> technical yeah, difficulties good. oh good lord going to message here i'm the <laughs> but yeah his book without a doubt is one of a really 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 great resource and i've told a bunch of people and i'll tell people here as well it, if you want to get his book that's like getting 10 8 or 10 years worth of organic gardening research all compiled into one book where you don't have to be searching over the internet here, there, the other place. It's just nice and compiled in one section. With, uh, good graphics that help explain the, the top patterns behind what's going on. It's a really great book. Yeah, and, and that teacher's edition, it has, you know, kind of the, the resources that if you were the teacher, you would give to the class for the assignment. Like, okay, go watch this video, <laughs> apply the knowledge in this way, or what did this person mean, which uh, I benefited from because, again, it's, you know, the textbook is good, um, but this gives you a little more deeper understanding, and it gives you the um, almost continuing education practices to go out and do. Mm -hmm. So that's important to, to me is, you know, you, you can learn something, but until you put it into practice or you see the practical application, um, it, it's not the full picture always. So yeah, having that is, is important. And full pictures. Matt, oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Full pictures. Uh, the, the, um, the book was called uh, rejuvenating soil by Matt powers and just like I said, absolutely wonderful book, especially if you want to get kind of caught up on organic stuff, because it's going to go through a lot of the stuff pretty quickly without being uh, too long winded. Yeah, it's you almost kind of have to be a little bit into textbooks or want to learn that type of stuff at a higher level. And, you know, I do. I, and I'm almost here sitting here thinking in the back of my head, it's like, uh, you know, I'd love to get my soil science professor and him together and just mm -hmm. talk because it, he has a lot of like new concept what well, not necessarily new concepts concepts <laughs> that we've like anecdotally have known for a while but putting more data behind it we're actually uh, starting to get science to, yeah yeah and so it would be fun to get kind of you know like a new the new guard and the old guard kind of lined up there it's sometimes i think um matt borders the the line of genius and insanity like he's that <laughs> smart and that forward sometimes. I'm like, God, this guy is just a genius or he's that and a little His off. energy is just I love it. It's up there and, and infectious. It's crazy. Yep. 
and and he was a teacher so he 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 knows how to relate on that level and the way that he presents yeah i love watching that guy hopefully i, I can get him on at some point um but to to the you know speaking again to the full picture one question i always kind of like to ask all of my guests um with is we've covered a whole lot of ground here i know we could probably keep going for a couple hours <laughs> but is there anything that I didn't ask you, or is there anything about the style of growing that you'd like to impart to the people listening? Uh, Sometimes the answer the is only no, thing. but <laughs> yeah, pretty much the only thing that I would like to impart is that uh, no matter how uh, natural living soil, how far you go into that rabbit hole, um, just know that by using more natural ways of farming, whatever you're farming, whether it be medicinals or food, that uh, you're helping to pass on generational what? knowledge as well as help save the planet by using more natural ways of farming. Yep. And we're saving the planet for the little folks like this. Oh, absolutely. Yep. We got to We got to leave the place better than we found it. We get, it looks like we got some rollerblade action okay, out there. Mm-hmm. Right. Got the safety pads. Doing it good. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. guess. Oh, guest cameo. Looks like a nice <laughs> sunny day. Nice it sunny does. day down there for Peter. I uh we're sitting in probably our first winter storm of the of the oh. year. So all my tomato plants blew over yesterday. A couple of them second. broke. <laughs> Got my peppers coming up. Mm -hmm. But uh, right. yeah, we're 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 frozen, <laughs> Peter. I can't I can't see the awesomeness. All right, right. and I'm out. <laughs> you guys are sad. Yay. <laughs> this, is, this is good. More more outside time, more fresh air. Oh, absolutely. Jack, you got to get it where you can. I'll let the note, wait, can I just do a close-up of your note's heat? Oh, we can't. We're stuck on a, we're stuck on a rollerblading picture at the moment. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool, folks. We are officially at 420 on the West Coast, so light them up, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. See you, Peter. Light up. And since I didn't give chat this opportunity yet, or I didn't do a call out, again, you guys are awesome. Thank you for being here for today. Thank you for participating as well. Um, you're a huge part of everything that we do. Oh, absolutely. Did you guys have any questions for uh, for the Green Goblin at the moment, other than what I what I've put up? Because um, now now's a good time. And again, um, while we're waiting, because there's obviously there's always a delay with uh, mm -hmm. YouTube and and the chats. Where can people find you? Where can they find more information? <laughs> uh if they want to you know follow up and learn more and like me learn some of these recipes well you can uh youtube search me uh, green goblin 510 i should come up right away on that one um, i also have a website green goblin 510.com um, you can also check me out uh, sundays on cltv we do a nice chill sesh over there smoking and, and talking about grill stuff as well um Awesome. Yes. I'm usually hanging out in uh, several Discord servers. You probably run into me somewhere. <laughs> several Discord servers. Let's see here. So we got one question. Uh, let's see here. Can I make a basil and flowers ferment just with rainwater? Um, uh, I imagine if... you could make a ferment out of anything. Uh, is there any nutritional basis uh, behind that one that you're aware um, of? The basil um, is going to provide a lot of the, the micronutrients, and the flowers is going to pro uh, provide some potassium as well. You can do it with just rainwater, um, especially if you're picking that basil and those flowers fresh in the morning time where there's still dew on there. You're going to be um, collecting some of the indigenous microorganisms that are just living on that plant, and that will help oh, wow. you to ferment the in. Uh, 
and that rainwater. Otherwise, you can use uh, labs. You can make some labs and add a little bit of labs to it. Or if you do have an IMO collection, you can use some uh, IMO as well as to help ferment that. that that's interesting. I'm, yeah, I'm picking up so much from this episode, mm -hmm. so thank you. But yeah, the, the little drops of water, they're keeping the microorganisms kind of encapsulated with that. And then you're dropping, basically chop and drop, and mm -hmm. that gets in there. Interesting. I like that. Uh, let's see here. How long has you been growing organic? And you said you've kind of been growing organic almost since the beginning, correct? Right. Yeah, pretty much. Like I said, I got maybe three grows in as a, as a mineral, using mineral grows. Um, and that, like I said, that started 08 uh, ish. So I'd say, Good. you know, nine, nine, 10 years organic. So Definitely, definitely ahead of, you know, uh, the curve, I would say. Organics is by no means new, um, but it wasn't very common. And it still no. isn't very common. We hear about it more in this particular space because we're interested. Um, yep. But yeah, to, to be ahead of the curve like that is awesome because I bet you've seen the progression of mm -hmm. the knowledge. And that always oh, adds. Oh, it's so crazy. Uh, that's did. what I was saying. That's why I like that, that Matt Powers book so much, because I've been learning along the whole time with everybody. I'm like, oh, wow, if if I would have had this book when I came into or, the organic sphere and was trying to learn a whole bunch about growing organically, this would have just this would have saved me so yeah. much time just yeah. by having all this information compiled in one spot. Yeah, I might have to open up that book and then maybe open up a dictionary online, or mm -hmm. you, you might have to use that textbook like a textbook, but yeah. there is just so much awesomely compiled information in that book about soil and, and itself that it's uh, crazy. That's awesome. And, and a lot of the mystery has been demystified too, as far as making your own soil mixes. There's a lot of people out there now that have they're published, you know, uh, you know, X amount of yards of soil, mm -hmm. X amount of ingredients. Uh, that takes a lot of the guesswork out of it, which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's see, here's here's a tough question um, because we always have so many that we love. But <laughs> uh, do you have top 10? Oh, that's a whole lot of flavors and smells. Um, how about smoking? Is your favorite plant to smoke your favorite plant to grow or is it different because um, sometimes the favorites can be a little yeah. finicky I w <clears throat> and to me it, it's the it's not that it's finicky like i really you know, as you could tell from the beginning of the interview i really like the blue grape i've held on to the blue grape yeah. for quite some time but i haven't actually smoked blue grape in maybe a couple of years because I'll just keep it alive because it is one leafy cultivar and I don't like defoliating it. It's a, it's a lot of work. That's a lot of time per plant that I have to spend on that plant. Now, is it worth it? To me, it is. Uh, is it worth it every time? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll mix in some other cultivars. Yep. Good, good call. And let's see here. Um, do you guys think it's more important to exhaust hot air out and of and blow fresh air in negative or positive pressure? Um, I personally like negative pressure just because it helps keep the smell in. When you go with positive pressure and its sides of the tents are blowing out, um, if you live in a red state or a place where growing is not cool, you might give yourself away. Uh, cause if it's, again, if it's blowing out, it's not going through the carbon filter first. So mm -hmm. I thought I'd now, take that one for us. Anything, yeah. to, anything to add on that? In an ideal world, let's say you're running a, a completely sealed facility. You're completely legitimately set up and you're running a sealed facility and a, in a, the perfect world, you're going to want positive pressure. In a perfect world, you want positive pressure in a facility because that's going to keep pests from coming in. It's mm -hmm. all blowing out. Correct. I get the, I get the logic there. Okay. Um, cannabis in, in a tent at home, would you prefer to do it that way as well? Um, in, the, in the house, no. I'd prefer exactly what you said. I'd like a slight negative pressure because um, 
especially in the home growth situation, you're not going to have the funds and or equipment that it takes to be able to uh, condition that air. Uh, there's heat, there's HVAC recovery um, units that can recover that air, cool it down, heat it up, put it back in your room. It gets pretty extravagant once you get up to that facility level. But at home, it's just way easier to have a slight negative pressure when you're at home. There's not a lot of bugs, hopefully, inside your home that you're going to have to worry about. Right. So there, that cuts down on that. And then a good portion of that slight negative pressure is going to help you control the heat that's in, in your grow space. Great answer, man. I thank you so much again for coming on. This has been uh, probably as educational and fun for me as it has been for the rest of chat today. <laughs> so, dude, no, we, uh, always good talking with you. Yeah, my, my pleasure. And we, we definitely have to do this again or at least carry it, keep the conversation going. Um, you got me intrigued and I'm definitely going to get get in your ear about those those <laughs> controllers and learn a little bit more myself. Um, it's amazing what you could do with those Raspberry Pis. So, yeah, especially cool. if you got a little bit a uh, little bit of tech know how and you, you like playing with technology, because it, I'm not going to say that, uh, you know, it it's super fast to set up but it's it's gratifying to set up it's you'll learn something setting it up and you'll be able to build your own sensors and save a little bit of money yeah the green goblin chad's younger cleaner brother okay <laughs> okay I'll, I'll go for that oh. i'll go for, <laughs> i'll go for that i did wash the hair today though guys come on man <laughs> but uh yeah i go with that so I guess one, one last time for, for everybody out there, uh, just please go ahead and shout out your contacts again because I don't want people to miss that. I want oh, people yeah, to yeah. Uh, connect with you. So one more time, where, where can they find you? Come check me out Fridays. I drop a lot of time Fridays on my channel, Green Goblin 510. You can come uh, check me out on CLTV Live on Sunday sessions over there. Um, you can come visit me on my website, greengoblin510.com. And... Uh, if you're part of a future cannabis project discord or any of the other multiple cannabis community discords you'll probably see me in there at some point yep and you're on you're on ig too you're on the instagrams yep. instagram on, on the gram on the gram <laughs> i had a guy ask me that once and i wasn't and i got pissed off i'm like what what do you think i'm not on nothing man what are you talking about he's like you on the gram yeah anyways old guy um <laughs> hey I, I had to learn from the uh from the stash guys, I had to learn about what uh, Twitch was. I'm trying to think oh, of yeah. the name. Yeah, Twitch. So, yeah, enough That's of embarrassing great, myself. I, I technically am on Twitch. I, I do stream occasionally, some video games over there, as, as much free time as I can get in. Cool, cool. Well, let's see. I uh, obviously I am Chad Westport. Let's put our names back up here. But me, uh, you can find me here every first and third Saturday of the month um you might be seeing a lot more of me too uh we're gonna try to get some more shows going for everybody get some more content out and up um but on instagram chad.westport boom peter's in the background mm -hmm. uh nice. you can also check me out uh website chadwestport.com and uh coming soon writing for uh sensi seeds so those oh, will be getting put nice. up pretty soon uh stoked about that and I booked my tickets for the Netherlands last night, so mm -hmm. I'm coming back. Um, but yeah, that, that's about it. Again, thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Green Goblin 510, that so much for joining us, dude. It was, it was a blast. So with that, everybody, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Oh, absolutely. Party on. Have a good one, y'all. Yeah, party on. Hit my button here.